This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. I have two guests on the podcast today, Scotty Neal and Mark Nooch. These guys were some of the first Americans into Afghanistan following the attacks of 9-11 with 5th Special Forces Group. And today they have horse soldier bourbon right here. If you haven't tried this, highly recommend you pick a bottle up or more than one bottle up. Such an honor to talk to these guys. And you can read more about their experience in Afghanistan in a new book called Swords of Lightning, Green Beret, Horse Soldiers, and America's Response to 9-11 by Mark Nooch, Bob Pennington, and Jim Felice. So check that out. You can go to horsesoldierbourbon.com. You can go to swordsoflightning.com. And what's really cool about these bottles is that each one is formed in molds from World Trade Center steel. So very cool. All right. So now, without further ado, the horse soldiers. Man, it's good to see you guys. Crazy. Look what I got here. Boom. Bam. I figured you guys, it's a little early, but I, th- I didn't know if you guys were already uh, partaking when I got here, your text. So, hey, 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 look at that. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to do this then. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I, I thought we might save it, but I might as well just do it right off the bat because... Uh, like, uh, I have I a four-hour rule. If I've been up for four <laughs> hours, it's okay. Wherever I'm at in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of figured Scotty would have one. So I was like, oh, I'll be, I'm in the be business, prepared. So it's... Uh, Bourbon's just isn't for breakfast anymore. That's what I can tell people, right? <laughs> is that one of your t-shirts? Is that uh yeah. is that well, all I need it again? It should be. Yeah. You know, the hard the fun part about this is getting just drunk enough to be clever enough to come up with t-shirt saying. And then the hard part is, is sober enough that you remember actually what they were. You want to write it down, have a pen in hand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> have a pen in hand. Oh man. Well, let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. I'm so excited to, to talk to you guys, but you both have stories that take you probably on semi different routes up to. And uh, uh, you're going to find out. Group. So, so let's give you. I'll give you a quick overview, right? Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Florida. My dad uh, or my uh, grandpa ran cattle. Mark grew up in Kansas. His family still cows. I went in fifth group uh, early on in the '90s. Mark went the officer route. Uh, The weekend of 9-11, Mark's team just got back from Uzbekistan with with the Spesnaz chasing IMU. And his team was assigned to get us ready to go into the Middle East on 1 October. Mm. So we uh, had our snipers inserted on this training exercise that was simulating the United States was being attacked. Wow. And then actually for me on the morning of 9-11, when the uh, intel sergeant came in, I thought it was part of the training exercise. So Mark had just left the team. Yep. He got called back a day later, just like you saw in the movie. And uh, was they were chosen to go in first because they had just gotten out of Uzbekistan. Yeah. Our mission and our team, so the sister teams, was we were focused on going further behind the lines to uh, – pick off the Taliban and Al Qaeda leadership at night. So yeah. Task force K bar Mm -hmm. task force day. Okay. Then after, uh, uh, left Afghanistan, Mark was a senior captain. He couldn't stay on a team any longer. And I was in a troop. I was troops are major and he came over to be the troop commander. And that's when we went to Djibouti and other places, Iraq, Iraq, you know what I mean? So as you know, the communities are very small. You're either on a team together or you're off the team together, but then you come back together. Then, you know, he took his path as a civilian and who are you guard for? Yeah. Prime Minister Alawi in Iraq. Oh, nice. We might've crossed paths. Uh, We probably did. We uh, were the, uh, a contract team that took over from the SEAL team that was protecting Prime Minister Alawi. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I helped stand that up in 2004. Four, I think, yeah, we were in Missoula and yeah. uh, they said, hey, you guys are going to head down to Baghdad and we're bringing all the teams from wherever they were in Iraq yep. in to help protect these guys. I think there was five interim Iraqi government officials at the time yeah. we were assigned to. So we had yep. like one laptop and one borrowed Mercedes from the agency and then we built it from there. Yeah, and, built uh, it out. So we, yeah. we did a handoff from, I can't remember what SEAL team, 
It was, but we, we took it. I took it. I was the AIC for the contract team. Uh, we took it in like December of 05. Okay. From, from one of your seal sister or brother seal teams. Yeah. That, um, I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, we all rotated through there. You know, yeah. every, I think every team rotated through at some point doing yeah. that mission. But we didn't have any training in in uh, in uh, personal protection or anything like that. We had right. no idea what we were doing. So we had uh, we brought some um, development group guys in that had done some of that in, yeah. uh, in Bosnia uh, years before, and they Those were the helped fun us years to try to be on a detail driving around. What's yeah. that? Those were the fun years trying to be on a detail driving around too. Oh, that was crazy. I remember we had, we started adding these, uh, adding more Mercedes to these things from the, you know, Mercedes, whatever their special projects plant or whatever. And they were yeah. very expensive. And then I remember one guy took one to the gym once and like ran into something by accident and put a big, like, big dent in it, backing up into something, going to the gym and, and back yeah. at it, you know, in the green zone. And they, they said, okay, no more driving the uh, million dollar cars around to the gym. Uh, we can stop that. But it was interesting to figure out how to do all that. Uh, yeah, we, and initially I think we just threw, we had gun trucks everywhere and we were just, you know, guns everywhere. And then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but uh, the IED threat started to really ramp yeah. up. And yeah. then we said, okay, off, out of the thin skins with gun everywhere. And they, you know, locked us down and, um, into the, uh, the, the up armor vehicles and everything, but it was interesting. It was cool to, to be a part of, I guess, you know, you wanted to be kicking doors in obviously, but you know, looking back, it was kind of a cool experience to set that up. You guys did a great job of setting us up because we had a fleet of vehicles with the Mercedes and the Suburbans and mm -hmm. and then the Hummer gun trucks. And it was it was I'm as proud of that mission as any other because uh, who everybody in the world wanted to kill that guy. Yeah, and we thought we thought it, when we got that in Missoula, I remember looking over at the the operations officer and he was like, "Wow, this is a suicide mission we're getting thrown into right here." Because I think wasn't there somebody before Alawi that got blown up like and uh, like right before and they're like, "Uh oh." Uh, we need to protect these guys. There was someone that was in the running in that group. Yeah. And I think something yeah. happened there in spring, early summer, maybe of 2004, uh, that really spurred them to say, okay, we need to get, who can do this? 2005 like, was a summer of love. You know what I mean? <laughs> it came from all angles. Uh, I was down South. So I had South Baghdad, Escondaria, Lutafia, Najaf. I mean, this, that whole, you know, lower area where yeah. either coming into the jab, the 3000 Iranians, I mean, it was nonstop oh, yeah. every other night. Yeah. Summer. That was a good time. Yeah. yeah. Summer, uh, August, 2004, uh, yeah. I took a sniper team into Najaf two, seven cab was in the lead, yeah. uh, there. It was like 11 days of just urban combat. It was like what I watched in world war two movies growing up. That was That's a legendary, man. I've read about that with the sniper, counter sniper operations going yeah. on there. It was crazy. I talked to you, man. You oh. and the other guys were doing that. Well, thank you. But if it's all due, Colonel Rainey, I'm sure he's, you know, hopefully he continued on. I'm not sure, but he was 27 Cav Battalion Commander out there. And, you know, I just went in there and said, hey, here's, here's our capabilities. Uh, how can we help? And yeah. uh, we had such a great working relationship and it was just amazing. But being able to maneuver Bradley's and Abrams, and then we could do the air because we had all the, you know, we're all JTACs or whatever. And so we could do those pre-planned air missions and then coordinate with everybody. It was amazing. It was really quite an experience to, uh, to be a part of that. But uh, I learned oh, a ton. Dude, we're going down some long, long buried war stories here. But uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so when the further finishes off, yeah. Mark went his way civilian. I stayed in. I came here to the headquarters. I became the senior enlisted advisor to the director of the interagency task force for counterterrorism. Big long, I had it on my desk. Yeah, that's, 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 that sounds serious right there. Uh, Ed Winters was one oh, of nice. my, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh -huh. then Scotty Miller came. So I got to, you know, be in the upper levels of government trying to figure out how to get along. And then we just kind of retired and wandered around a bit try to be gunslingers. I got too old for that. And we said, Hey, actually one of the guys he served with started a distillery in Scotland yeah. and that's how it started. We just wanted to go visit distilleries. Really? We went to Scotland and that kicked off the bug. One of the, one of the SBS guys that was on that protective security yeah. detail, uh, or I'm sorry, he worked for the same company. He was in Basra and I was in Baghdad mm. and he, we learned, I, uh, we wanted to go to Scotland. And I reached out to my brick contacts and their special ops and, and they're like, Hey, you know, so-and-so he's got a distillery going. And so I rang him up and they would like, come on over, man. It, they're, they are a great kind of mentor yeah. partner. You know, they make an excellent scotch. It's called uh, Wolfburn. Yeah. Wolfburn. Well, I like that name. Yeah. Yeah. That means Wolf Creek. 
Yeah. Huh. They huh. showed us the ditch out back where they get the water. Like, what, what are you talking about treating the water? It's a ditch out back. You eat yeah. enough of quills. It's okay. But, nice. Uh, so you guys just wanted to go visit a distillery in Scotland and that's it. Yeah. No way. And then did you get the idea there? Said, Hey, why don't we do something similar uh, in the I, United States or professional development, professional research, you know? So oh, how yeah, it's very important. Started, and I don't know if we've even started our conversation. So screw it. Yeah. Yeah. We're in. All right. So how the bourbon started. So there's a couple phases. There's the horse soldier, soldier side of us. Then there's a horse soldier bourbon side of us. Okay. Right? You're looking at the bottle now. That image is actually the statue at Ground Zero called the America's Response Monument. Right? That bottle, you have the arrow and the hatchet. That's because of our Ranger and Special Forces background. Nice. Broad shoulders, because that's the weight of our nation we carried. The mold, which you can see up above us, that mm -hmm. is from World Trade Center steel that forms that bottle. So there's a lot of hidden meanings. And the best part about that is the wives design that really? on their own. They had their own branding planning cell and they came up with all of that. No kidding. Yeah. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the, you know, no, knowing you, uh, yeah. They right. So everything beautiful is the wives. Everything bold is us. No kidding. And what happened was, is I was director of the green beret foundation, wow. uh, 2013, 14, we were paying more money uh, to the guys that were getting killed as contractors, right? Or injured. So there was no fund. There was nothing to help support them. And uh, I, I saw a niche and the SEALs did a great job with the Honor Foundation about transition, right? Connect to a network, reposition yourself, find your future, not your past. And so we created a program, the Green Beret Foundation called the Next Ridge Line. So how am I going to get from here to here and all the valleys and peaks. And we had a big fundraiser in New York City. We honored Roger Ailes at the time, was the head of Fox, you know, find the richest guy in the room. He gives you lots of money and his friends. And on stage, I said, I quit. And if I can't go and follow these tenants, you deserve your money back. So phase one is going and finding a mentor. And uh, we did, his name was John Coco, previous Green Beret and agency guy, successful in business. Wow. I said, John, will you be my business mentor? And he said, no problem. When I get back from Montana, you and I will sit down together and figure it out. And I said, what are you doing in Montana? And he goes, every year I go to Yellowstone for three months. And I said, I don't have a job. Can I go with you? I'll pay my own way. And he goes, come on. So we had the greatest Mutt and Jeff adventure of high debauchery of drinking, climbing the Tetons, fishing the slough everything. And then at the end, we had a 10 day horse and mule train through the middle of the thoroughfare. Wow. Right? Less than a hundred people a year. And every night you're sitting there talking, right? And for him, I think I didn't realize at the time, but he was trying to get me to slow my mind down. Mm. Right. It's like patience, relax. Mm. Look at this beautiful sunset. Look at this. I didn't get the warrior gardener mentoring. And at the end of the 10 days, we gave the horses back. And as we're going out the uh, West Gate, uh, we stopped at a little craft distillery called Grand Tetons. And they made vodka. And so we muscled up to the bar, still stinky from the trail. And we said, hey, free tastings. And uh, John's wife, Elizabeth, was with us. She did 10 days in the bush as well. And uh, first thing she did was pick up the bottle and start feeling the label. And asking her what kind of font, what color blue was on it. Huh. Why did she use that image? And John's first question is, how much do you make it for? How much profit's in it? And I was like, well, what time do you show up in the morning to make the biscuit? And that literally started our curiosity. So much so that we spent three weeks from Driggs, Idaho, back to Tampa, Florida, hitting every craft distillery. Hmm. Where I immediately called Mark, said, Mark. This is so awesome. We ought to go to Scotland. Bob, who was Mark's uh, chief warrant officer, said, I love scotch. And then that's when he reached out to Andrew. And that began our journey to learn how to make whiskey and bourbon. No kidding. That is crazy. At the time, did you know the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Not really. Uh, yucky. Delicious. All right. <laughs> Fighting. Yeah. Sipper. And okay. we went into Ireland, right? And the Irish, it's almost like Kung Fu versus Wenchu 
versus karate. Each master distiller has their philosophy on making it. When we went into Ireland with Podge, couldn't understand a word he said. Yeah. Zero English to English translation. Yeah. But they focus on the ceremony of drinking with your friends, right? Mm. They don't care. They're making it. They make the batch. The Scots were very meticulous. Huh. Every detail. So much so that I think Andrew knew one time when we left the refrigerator open because he counts the kilowatt hours to know the efficiencies wow. of how much yield per bush. I mean, it was just science. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ireland is like, yeah, that's <laughs> that's we'll mix it around. Hey, you want to try some old stuff? Yeah. Actually, one of uh, John's sons, Hunter, is a sommelier s backpack trust fund kid. We blindfolded him and he selected, we put 10 Irish whiskeys out there. He could name every one of them, blindfolded by tasting them. That's how his taste profile is. Wow. So we started to see with our backgrounds that we had business sense. We had branding sense. We had a hard work ethic. Operations. Operations, right? Yeah. We had a passion to pursue our enemies, which became other brands. Uh-huh. So we stocked them on the shelves. We stocked them in data. We stocked them in their marketing. And uh, we just you know, took them at it. And then the horse soldier bourbon part, actually, we didn't know what to call the brand. Because there wasn't a movie back then. Nobody knew yeah. about really the horse soldiers. Boom. And yeah, there's a real book. There's this. Yeah. So Mark will tell you about that. Which one's that in the background? Which one's that? Yeah. Uh, that's our team's new book called Swords of Lightning that uh, Chief Pennington and I uh, just, along with uh, Jim DeFelice, co authored, and we just launched our book. Uh, it, it's out right now? It's out. How do I not know this? Scotty, what's going on? Come on, man. Because we need Navy SEAL publicists. I'm you telling you. Yeah. I need your, <laughs> I need your advice. Right. Outside of this thing, I need your advice. Man. I got to find out now if this thing is out? Hey, Jeez. I'm the last to know. What kind, That's another episode. But what kind of operation are you guys fighting. running over there? Jeez. So let's get into the fun part. But the bourbon part yeah. started organically. It wasn't a celebrity brand. It wasn't because a movie came out or anybody yeah. knew. It's because brothers who served together were lost. We found a reason for us to bring our families together. We found that common pursuit of learning whiskeys and bourbons. And then if you know the history of bourbon, it's a history of fire and rebellion. Oh, right? go, tell me more about that. Well, the very first, so here we go. Sugar Tax Act before the Tea Act restricted black tar molasses coming from the Caribbean to make rum. Okay. Then the Scotch-Irish distillers started using grains. Then the Tea Act was the straw that broke the camel's back. They turned into revolution. The very first tax on America after the revolution was a tax on whiskey. Wow. It led to the Whiskey Rebellion, yeah. which was soldier distillers, tar and feathering, tax revenues. Wow. So much so that George Washington put the uniform back on as president, mm-hmm. raised the Continental Army to march on our own people, which drove them across the Appalachian Cumberland Trail into Kentucky. And most of them were veterans. Okay. So fast forward to Bourbon, uh, Van, Pappy Van Winkle, World War II, mm. Colonel E. Taylor, Jack Daniels, Jim Bean. Name a popular bourbon brand, and they are all veterans. No kidding. So there's a wow. good book called, um, what is it? Ah. Uh. I'll tell you in a second. I yeah, we'll think of it. I'm oh, going to write that down too. Book book yeah. on, yeah, veterans and whiskey bullets, or something like that. Bullets and bourbon. Yeah. Bullets and bourbon. No way. Yeah. It tells the history of bourbon in America and its surprising connection to veterans. Yeah. Coming home for war, plowing fields, having to still at night, moonshiners, all of the famous people you think you know in history, a bunch of jamokes, okay. you know, looking to build their American dream. So, Wow. All of that fascinated us so much that, you know, we, we began to gain traction. We finally, somebody said, why don't you call it Horse Soldier? We're like, well, probably because the name's taken. And we did an IP search and it wasn't. So that's when we did it. That's when the movie came out. Mark will tell you about that shining catastrophe. <laughs> and uh, the funny part about the bourbon side is 
we quickly made some uh, bottles and some labels, took it to the red carpet premiere. And in our trunks, not knowing how whiskey distribution is supposed to go, right? Everybody's looking around like, these guys know you can't do that, right? We're like, we're doing I don't it. know, we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but that then we learned fantastic. that today we're the eight, number eight uh, premium bourbon in the country that nobody knows about. Wow. So we've grown this from nothing to 100,000 six pack cases to we're building a $240 million distillery in Somerset, Kentucky. Amazing. Not Amazing. bad. What is, I mean, what an incredible story. And I'll tell yeah. you, people know about it. I mean, we were in uh, at UFC and we had this uh, private, it was a uh, terminal list sponsored the UFC in, on July 2nd. So I'm there with Chris Pratt and everybody. And right behind the bar, we had our own private like room. And then we had front row seats and we go back and forth. And this was there, so we all poured this, and we all put more than more than one shot of this. And uh, I think I took a picture of it and sent it to you. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so this was right there, and it was front and center. So uh, so people know, and uh, and people are fired up about it. And I, I remember back in gosh, let's say two thousand four, five, six, somewhere in that time frame, there was a uh, they were trying to raise money for that statue at yeah. uh, at Ground Zero, and they were they actually had they were selling miniature uh, statues. Of, of this. And it, I think back then it was like 10 grand or something. Yeah. Um, of course, back a, then a reach. I didn't have, yeah, that was must have, might, could have, might as well have been 10 million back then. Uh, yeah. But I always wanted, I really wanted one of those. Um, I don't know how many they made, but they're, you know, I'm sure there are out there, are a few out there. Well, these are all questions you should ask Mark, because there's a little bit of history behind each and every one of these things. I am sure. <laughs> I am sure. But uh, talk, speaking of history, uh, what was that path up to 9-11, up to fifth group for, for each of you? Did you come in the army? Was it SF baby program? Did that exist back then? Or did, no, did I, not? I, uh, I was a Kansas state army ROTC, uh, cadet in the Nebraska national guard, long range surveillance unit as a cadet. And then going through the ROTC program, got active duty infantry, uh, you know, ranger school pathfinder, then the 101st airborne was my first you know, platoon leader uh, and rifle company XO experience and and had volunteered, got into the Ranger Regiment uh, to go to selection there. Uh, so I got into, uh, I was a weapons platoon leader in Alpha Company, 3rd Ranger Battalion. And that was my introduction to the special operations, you know, community. And as a young uh, second lieutenant still and first lieutenant time, and I was like, hey, I like this special operations community. I want to be a part of it. And uh, I volunteered to go to Special Forces Selection and, and ended up uh, getting assigned to 5th Special Forces Group uh, in late uh, 1999. Had about half a dozen deployments into the Middle East prior to 9-11 in those two years. Uh, you know, the, the usual Kuwait, Jordan, and then yeah. our team had been in Uzbekistan uh, for over six months, multiple trips, working with their Spetsnaz. Oh, yeah thousand that were already fighting against uh al-qaeda affiliates so. you know i think we, we we spent more time on the same ground um so september 11th i was deployed second it was two weeks into my second deployment we ended up going and doing the shipboardings uh out of kuwait to enforce the u.n embargo against iraq and team three goes in to Afghanistan. Uh, we thought we were going to Afghanistan, but anyway, we did the ship warnings. But after that, they asked for volunteers to go to Uzbekistan. And so right off of that deployment, I go to Uzbekistan and help train up their, uh, their uh, Spetsnaz snipers and yep. uh, had to learn the, the Dragunov because I hadn't shot that thing before. So had to learn that and learn that scope and the whole, you know, the whole thing. And it was fascinating. I was still enlisted at the time and, and it, was, uh, it was a great experience, but we're on that lake out there and there was a there was they said that sf um uh odas had come through and, and trained them yeah. before yeah. and i think their battalion commander who's a crazy man uh the rumor was that he had he had jumped into afghanistan uh in uh in 79 or something like that i was trying to do the math in my head he was pretty old but he was pretty mean i remember that yeah um, <laughs> i'm wondering now you got me wondering if it was the same guy so the the battalion the spetsnaz battalion we were working with their battalion and commander and i got to be uh you know, close as you could in that relationship. But he was just what you're saying. He was an Af Soviet Afghan war veteran. And so he's, he's the one teaching me the RPG seven, oh, wow. uh, the AGS 17, the grenade launcher and the Dishka 51 
you know, uh, uh, heavy machine gun and all that. And so we just not, this is pre nine 11. I'm getting a soda straw of lessons learned from a, a Russian wow. Spetsnaz officer from, you know, that's now an officer in the Uzbek special forces. So wow. uh, just great, great pre, we didn't know it, you know, yeah. you're just soaking up range day, getting to know each other too much vodka at night. Oh, the uh, vodka was insane. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this before. Water. And yeah, I, I mean, I, would, water anyway, so I was figuring out how to, you know, I'm not proud of it, but there was no way to survive with those guys unless you're dumping that oh, stuff. And no it was way. awful. It was awful. You're just trying to, and they're going to test you. You know, you know they're going to test you. They're going to push you. You know, you're going to lose. <laughs> yeah, that's awful. They, they, they've been drinking vodka since they were three. Yeah. You know? Oh, I remember. Uh, yeah, I distinctly remember though. So it's and, just how, you know, what can you give a good showing? Uh <laughs> It's all you can do. All you can do. I mean, I think it was maybe one of the first times I saw kettlebells. Like their their gym uh, was fairly uh, uh, primitive, I guess. Primitive. But they, were, they had kettlebells concrete, out there. Concrete with rebar. Bit. Yeah, exactly. What? Yeah, yeah. No, I totally. Yeah. I think we must have been in the same place or the same places. Um, and then we would send uh, a couple guys would go um, to what the embassy or annex or something like that in in town and and do some yeah. stuff um, there. But mostly we were out you know, in the field with these guys. Uh, yeah. But getting behind that dragon off was pretty cool. Uh, SVD 63 and, and learning that piece. And now that finds its way into my, into my novels from that experience. So, uh, yeah. so that was fun, but that mine was out. Yours was before. So mine was after. And of course I was just trying to get as close to Afghanistan as I could in the off chance that I'd get to get to go over there. And then, you know, the year I went, came back, went to OCS, came out of there and then went right to Afghanistan as an augment for, for one of these coast seal teams, which was another great experience. So I got pretty lucky, especially as a new officer. Yeah, we went, we went through their airborne school. They wanted to do a wing exchange, right? Oh, wow. So we, we did a crash course, like two week, you know, go through their airborne school. We were supposed to jump uh, with them. That got can The jump itself got canceled, but we had done all the train up. And uh, um, uh, the IMU, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. kicked off major active shooter coordinated attacks across Tashkent. Tashkent, yeah, they remember. Organa Valley and overwhelmed their security forces. Well, our, the unit we were training got got activated or mobilized rather uh, to deploy to the crisis site. So our training aspect uh, shut down. They went off and fought uh, these guys. And then we, we they held us in country and then uh, we picked back up training a couple of weeks later. But that unit... Uh, gave a good account of itself. And, oh, wow. and, um, uh, we had right before they got activated, we had put them through like a, a 10 day ranger school mountain phase of small unit tactics and patrolling. So I had two at that time, two of my sergeants are split up with their teams and we're doing force on force, small unit tactics, you know, raid reconnaissance yeah. and all, all patrol bases, all that kind of stuff. So, that introduction to the Uzbek culture, language, the, you know, the regional orientation is what set us up for the uh, post 9-11 mission. No kidding. Wow. Man, and then Scotty, what, what was your path then? So your fifth I, group, your path to 9-11. I, I joined in 1986, you know, right out of high school. It's all I've ever wanted to do. And uh, I went to the 7th Infantry Division out of Fort Ord, California, the Light Fighters. Wow. And at the time, it was where one entire battalion went through basic training, advanced individuals. So everybody was a cohort. And I think it culminated into Panama. You know, we went in. I was at Fort Espinar. Uh, I called a live fire exercise with pop-up targets because America likes to beat up on little countries at the time. And I remember the SF guys running around before the battles in their silky shorts and mustaches. <laughs> and I'm in full kit in a foxhole. You know, being told that, it, you know, I'm like, hold on a second. That exists. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, what so you, is didn't, that? you didn't know what SF was beforehand? No, no. I mean, I remember John Wayne and you, you kind of remember uh, First Blood. Yeah, it didn't it register, though. It didn't like register in your head that this was something yeah. that was real. But then it's like, OK, I'm, I'm the guy that always wants to be on that side. What am I doing here? I want to be over there. Yeah. And so I went through selection in uh, 92 and I got to fifth group in 1995. My first team, uh, 571, were actually the ones that did the Kuwaiti underground and resistance. Oh, wow. So imagine it's a year and a half after 
And these guys are telling stories around the team room. And I'm just a young Green Beret going, holy crap. But throughout from 93, I mean, I did Kenya, Somalia, um, Pakistan. I trained every year with the SSG, um, Yemen. I mean, just name any Middle Eastern country. We were in and out. Uh, and then in between, you're going to various advanced schools. Unfortunately for me, in 99 and 2000, I had to go be a drill sergeant. Oh, wow. Back to regular army, oh. gender integrated. Did you get in trouble or something? What did, what did you have to go back for? Uh, I think special forces had to give up two Green Berets a year oh. as some requirement. I got screwed. I must have been pissed <laughs> people off. I was a Viking Green Beret, so I knew I probably deserved that time out. <laughs> but when I left, it was the summer of 2001, and fifth group had what they call a commander's and extremist force. Mm -hmm. But that is our advanced force in the Middle East. Usually it's uh, kind of a sniper platoon and two assault platoons or, or squadrons. Call it whatever the moniker is right. for that. And we were getting ready for our rotation on 1 October. That's why Mark's team had just got back from Uzbekistan. Their scuba team was taking our snipers down the Cumberland River to insert on this suspected compound to observe it. And the assaulters were supposed to hit on Wednesday, 9-12. So once again, when the intel sergeant walks in on Tuesday, 9-11, we yeah. thought it was just an expansion of the training exercise. Right. So this is a national level training exercise. So it's very complex, mm -hmm. you know, very well orchestrated. Everything's there. And there's always the wrench, right? Here comes the monkey in the wrench. Yeah. And then he come in another hour later, said the second World Trade Center has been hit. And we're still in isolation planning. And it wasn't until four hours later that uh, Mulholland came in and said, stop what you're doing. This is not an exercise for real. And we went over to the mess hall and we saw it on TV like everybody else. Wow. Man, that's crazy. So then it begins this parallel track of Mark's team and our team, you know, and I don't know how SEAL team planning goes on missions, but SF is very unique where it's competitive, like a joint venture investment group. Uh. You have the commanders on top that has all the resources and money and a team comes in and pitches what they're going to do. Wow. Then the commander will select. So Which one yeah. gets it? That uh, deliberate mission planning cycle, you know, typically five days and you're given a, a series of briefings to mm -hmm. the, the commander, you know, to continue to proceed and planning and whatever. Uh, we didn't have any of that. Uh, uh, our team got informed September 14th that we were going to, we were it. Uh, we were going to be the first to deploy out uh, from the 5th Special Forces Group at Fort Campbell. Uh, I think at that time we had 45 man teams. Um, 45 A teams. Yeah, 45 uh, Special Forces A teams. Um, and uh, we deployed out. That mission didn't really uh, uh, materialize. We had, uh, you know, immediately they tell you you're going to deploy. Then there's false starts. We oh, didn't yes. go. So now we're we're breaking the pallets open and we're just, you know, uh, using that time to continue to train. Uh, we had about three false starts, you know, where you said your goodbyes to the family and then uh, uh, the plane doesn't come or something. Yeah, yeah. something messed up and you end up going home again that night. So this roller coaster ride on the families. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they deployed us over to Uzbekistan. Uh, so you, we flew into, you flew into like K2 or something like that? We flew into yeah. K2, but we were, we literally were like this seventh aircraft to land. Uh, so we slept on the ground the first several nights there in the lee of, uh, a uh, former Soviet MIG bunker. I mean, you're sleeping wow. outdoors. We brought our own sleeping bags and stuff, you know. Um, and then it just built up around us. And then uh, we got the, uh, you know, the Super Bowl mission, a uh, whole story behind that, to conduct unconventional warfare. We'd been, you know, incredible sergeants on these teams, very smart, savvy. So we became kind of the test team of submitting the RFIs, requests for information to the group intelligence, you know, going, hey, we think we could work with this group or that group. And the guys are just intensely studying on our own the region, 
you know, doing that uh, area study, area familiarization of Afghanistan and what type of mission could we be applied to. And so we started to identify these different uh, ethnic militia uh, leaders mm-hmm. in the north, General Dostum, uh, the Uzbeks, Commander Atta, the Tajiks, uh, Commander Mokek of the Hazaras, and they each have been independently fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, to varying degrees of success in the northern provinces. And so we, we proposed an unconventional warfare mission to match uh, a, a team uh, with them. And that was coming down because of uh, uh, geopolitically, uh, uh, then CIA Director Tenet had proposed the strategy of matching teams of CIA paramilitary officers that had those relationships with the Northern Alliance uh, to match those CIA teams with special forces teams to, to be the military advisors for these militia groups. So that that's kind of how that unfolded. Our entire operations order was about two eight and a half by 11 pages. So no big volumes from the central <laughs> command going, this is how we are prepared. Yeah. We hadn't got it there was, yet. Yeah. <laughs> there, you go. there was no big existing contingency plan to do operations in Afghanistan. It's being, this whole thing is being built in flight and special forces and the broader special operations community is being asked to be the main strategy early on. So they built yeah. task force dagger, uh, and put it into uh, Uzbekistan at a secret base called Karshi Khanabad or K2 at that time. But it included the Air Force Special Operations, right? All the players. You got to have lift assets and JTACs. And and uh, um, uh, and then we had, the, of course, the 160th Night Stalkers. You know, we got to have lift with Hilo. So we had the MH-47s and, and the DAPs, the MH-60 yeah. gunship, all that. And, oh, yeah. And then all these interagency folks that would show up. And, but it, I, I tell people about this. We were so far left in this. We were waiting on, you know, uh, was it NGA, National Geospatial Agency, to even print us maps of the right scale. So we are, you know, we're still studying, right? You're using that time. We're reading literally National Geographic magazines and using tourist roadmaps to start to learn the people, the culture, the terrain, the geography you know, uh, and start to put a plan together long before they even gave us a tactical map in the right scale that we needed. Um, but, uh, you know, we, our team was tapped to be one of the first uh, sent in. Uh, another ODA uh, 555, Triple Nickel, Nickel as they're known, another dive team. Uh, they were tapped to go in uh, to the Panjashir and work with uh, Fahim Khan. So, that's kind of a task force dagger that was built around fifth special forces group and, and the various uh, components. And uh, the, our two teams would be inserted the same night, night of October 19th, they would be inserted into the Panjashir and our team uh, was put uh, into a single MH 47 uh, Chinook special operations helicopter. And, and we had a couple of the armed uh, Blackhawks DAPs. Uh-huh. As, as escort, and uh, we lifted off for a four-hour insertion. They had to aerial refuel the helicopters from the Air Force Special Operations C-130. So wow. you, just, the, the insertion was phenomenal phase. Uh, after we crossed through Tajikistan and south into Afghanistan, uh, we hit a surprise sandstorm. And you know, at that time, the MH-47 it has a multi-mode radar. So the pilots are flying off of instruments, basically, and computer cues to climb or descend, you know, speed up, slow down. Well, the the escort gunships, those pilots are flying. They don't have that. They're flying off of night vision goggles and they're queuing off of the Chinook and the glow from the engines. And and uh, uh, the weather turned horrible and and went through the minimums and we almost had a midair collision. I'm told a couple times, which would have been disastrous. And those pilots uh, are amazing. They most, they, you know, I've flown with them. I'm sure you've worked with them. Yeah. You know, they're the best helicopter pilots in the world. And they had the maturity to say, look, we got to break off. And so they, the gunships broke off and we continued single ship uh, in that MH-47. And they put us right down in a, a mountain valley at 2 a.m. local time in the morning, we met our CIA team on the drop on the landing zone there, and you know 
rocked into a, a house, a compound that they had. And we, the next day we met General Dostum. So no that's way. kind of no our way. insertion of, of getting in to the incredible Super Bowl mission. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He had to pinch we had one of our sergeants, Bill Bennett, uh, one of our medics every day. One of his first phrases was like, we are in Afghanistan. You just had to, it's like, you're here. You're where everybody you're wanted it. to be. Everybody in special <laughs> operations and Around, outside of special operations even. Yeah. You were in it. Uh, we were worried we we're yeah. going to miss it, especially when we, because we were the same thing. We're in, in Guam. Then we palletize. I have to do a little uh, personal protection bodyguard deal for uh, Commander Sink Pack Fleet to go visit a couple allies and then back. And we're just waiting, waiting. We think we're going to Afghanistan, but same type of thing. False starts, all the rest of it. And then we get on the plane and we're flying there in the C-17 and they're like, it's an honor to fly you guys down range. And we think we're going. And then we go to Kuwait and do ship warnings, which was actually... You know, pretty interesting. That's the only time I was on a ship my entire time in the in the military. Um, but uh, but we thought we missed it. You know, we thought you guys got it. We missed it, and because uh, that's what that was the up to this point. You know, if you missed Panama, you you know you missed it. If you missed Grenada, you missed it. Missed uh, uh, Mogadishu. You know, you weren't. It was these flashpoints, and we thought, yeah. you know, because that's that, that's our history you know, in the last twenty years. Obviously, nine eleven changed things. You know, obviously nine eleven changed things. It was, uh, you know, the gloves come off, right? You've attacked the homeland and these thousands of, of American citizens and international citizens that have lost their lives. Um, but, you know, there was the risk was off the chart. Mm -hmm. um, but there's immense political pressure on Colonel Mulholland that was the task force commander at the time. And, you know, Secretary Rumsfeld literally is skipping over General Franks at times and calling down going, when are you getting the special uh, special forces team in on the ground, you know, because of the weather, we had some delays. Uh, but uh, you got in on the ground and it just had incredible autonomy and authority uh, going in in the brief back. They didn't, it's pretty, you have to have a long look in the mirror. They didn't expect us really to survive. You know, you're, the expectation is there's going to be casualties. We want you to go in there and link up with these, these uh, militia groups that we've identified assess if we can work with them or not, you know, do our goals and objectives kind of align? Can, can we work with these groups or not? And some we knew we couldn't. Um, but, uh, um, you know, they didn't expect to see it for six months. Yeah. Go in there. If you can work with these group, arm and equip them, raise up a militia army, gather intelligence, winter up in the Hindu Kush and wow. we'll see it in the spring when the Marines and army are finally in ready. You, you'll come down and support the army and the Marine Corps as we come in with the bigger conventional force invasion. Wow. So as we got in there, you know, that strategy initially became the main effort. And then we assessed that these forces are capable. They are ready to go. Here's the resources we need, lethal aid, non-lethal aid financial aid and uh, humanitarian aid, all of that started to flow in. So there's just incredible logistical effort to support that. Uh, our team and the CIA team and a couple others, uh, forces teams that would come in to help us. We, real magic that's not in our, you know, in the movies or, or other books uh, is we united these different ethnic factions that had been independently fighting uh, the Al Qaeda and Taliban and we got them to sit together in the same room. But tell them how far and, you had to ride just to go. Yeah, but yeah, the shocking thing was we were on horseback, you know, doing all this, riding every day, meeting with different local leaders and these these mili military or militia commanders as well. So, uh, but we got these leaders in the same room, and they pledged fighters, and it wow. we raised up a militia army of of. Uh, nearly 5,000 militia fighters between these three different ethnic factions. And we orchestrated an uprising across the uh, six Northern provinces. I mean, so you're doing the classic fighters. SF mission that, you know, you it read is. about, you train for, you go through yeah. key course talking about and dreaming yeah. about, man. But uh, that, you know, the other aspect of that, that we really didn't expect was that we would end up riding horses. Yeah. So our, uh, you know, nobody back in 2001 was being trained in how to ride horses. You know, really, I had ridden horses in, in pre 9 11 in the different countries, but it was a rapport builder. Yeah, right. You know, my counterparts, it was recreational. It right. was a stoke or a trail ride or some touristy kind of thing, you know. Um, but I'd ridden in, in Jordan at Petra. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, this portrayed in Indiana Jones. I'd ridden Kuwaiti Shakes 
that some of my sergeants had worked with during the first Gulf mm-hmm. War oh, that were in the Kuwaiti resistance. Yep. Well, now they're senior commanders in the Kuwaiti uh, security forces. And, Man. and so they invite, and they're all into thoroughbred race horses. So okay. they invited us out as honored guests and, uh, right. you know, got, you know, again, that horse connection that I grew up with uh, in a farming and ranching community in Kansas soon yeah. knew it was going to be so critical in the conduct of, of our uh, historic missions. Yeah. Uh, the other guys on the team, we joked they had quarter horse training. That's when mom and dad took them to the uh, uh, grocery store or something. They were <laughs> a mechanical horse. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> quarter, you know, thrown into the machine or whatever. But so those guys did an amazing job as OJT, you know, learning how to ride horses in combat. Yeah. You know, we have the best training that you can have, but none of us were, were prepared to ride horses in combat. Yeah. So we're figuring out right there at the trot. Uh, how do you carry a rifle? Uh-huh. What gear do you have on your back? What do I leave behind? You know, can I trust these militia forces that I just met? They're right. also on back. You know, they warned us there's Taliban in the area, there's mines, and now you're on this half crazy animal, uh, you know, that uh, you're trying to figure out how to ride. And we're creating the, the standard operating procedure literally right there at the, at the trot. And yeah. six of us after meeting General Dostum, uh, our first period of daylight in Afghanistan after he briefed us where the enemy's at and uh, uh, the CIA team and I are having that meeting with General Dostum along with uh, Chief Pennington and our uh, team sergeant. Um, Dostum agreed to take six of us to his mountain headquarters and we would quickly mount horseback for the first time, uh, not knowing how far you we were going to go. It ended up being about four plus five hour ride. Mm-hmm. uh up to his mountain headquarters um and then we laid eyes on the enemy headquarter uh, command post we had a b-52 uh coming in uh as our first show of force wow we're on station from that but he kept us way far away you know so you know we're, we're using old school kind of call for fire techniques where we had to uh uh triangulate off of a map no real garments back then yeah uh yeah the, back then the new device everybody remember the garmin gps vista oh yeah i think i still so have they, one somewhere in a bag yeah i still got one they they ran out and bought those out of cabela's and bass pro <laughs> morgan good stores and we loved them because they run on double a batteries but every guy got one mm. right so now it's that little lightweight device was invaluable uh but yeah we're we're having to pinpoint where that enemy command post is at uh, through, uh, uh, triangulation, mm. you know, shoot compass and azimuth and sending guys out to your left and right along the ridge and they're shooting an azimuth to it. And you're plotting it out on the map, you know? Uh, but we had that B 52 come in and, uh, uh, made some strikes near the enemy. Didn't, didn't, uh, hit them, but we were within a couple hundred meters of them. And, uh, the, uh, I just remember our militia allies all started cheering as they saw the explosions, they could hear them echoing across the valley. And, and then General Dostum was like, okay, let's, I'll, we want to attack. We want to attack tomorrow. Wow. So started to plan for that and move closer to the enemy. And then we had a front row seat to uh, a witness uh, the first cavalry charge no, of about 300 horsemen against tanks and artillery uh, and, and infantry. And it was just amazing. What are you thinking when you see that? Are you like, what on earth? Like you, you guys expected not to come home essentially. And if you're going to get support, it's coming in the spring and you guys are out there hanging it out. Uh, what, what do you have? Do you have like an M4 with an ACOG and a PEC two or what do you, what do you guys, what are you guys carrying? Uh, yeah. Uh, our team, uh, stuck with the M4s. Uh, we went heavy on the grenade launchers. Uh, out of 12 of us, we had, uh, four guys carrying grenade launchers. Nice. 203s uh, there with you? Yeah, the, two, the M203s. Uh, we had ACOGs uh, mostly because of the mountain environment and expected some longer shots. Um, two of the guys, they had, see, again, man, we're going back to back then. Yeah. yeah. The, remember the uh, the new, the SPR, the new special purpose rifle. SR25s. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So we had SR25s, right? Yeah, That's course. in the, uh, the 308s, right? But the new SPR was a 5.56, five, uh, longer Spirit barrel. barrel. Yeah. 
servers done. Yeah. So yeah. it was our like Mark but, 12. Like we, we designated yeah, yeah. the Mark 11 yeah, for the SR25 and the Mark 12 yeah. and the 556 version. So, but I remember those early uh, SR25s. Those were, you could buy one from Knights back then in like 2000. Okay. Once again, I think it was 15 grand, which must have, you know, might as well have been 15 million back then for, you know, E4, yeah. E5. Um, but man, I wish I'd picked one up back then. Dang it. Yeah, but several several of the guys uh, uh, brought that because it shared common. You know, we're having some deep discussions. Do you carry AK forty sevens like your counterparts, or do you stick with the M fours and the five five six ammunition requirements? So we stuck with that, but we kept everybody having common ammunition. Mm-hmm. So two of our uh, uh, snipers carried the uh, our weapons guys carried the uh, the five five six special purpose rifle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. With little, they had little, uh, was the Mark IV little bolts yeah, on yeah, yeah. back then. Um, but uh, uh, we even brought a couple uh, M79 grenade launchers, yeah, right? absolutely. Um, uh, we went heavy on on uh, grenades, uh, we had little pursuit deterrent munitions, uh huh. Um, yeah, actually, an M79 holster. Nice. Did you, did you cut, cut it? Did you make it a pirate gun? gun? Did you guys cut it down? Exactly. Yeah. And it had a holster on the side of my leg. I still got that sucker. Yeah. Nice. You get creative when you're young. Yeah. You're like, all right. Oh, yeah. But the other thing that was new was, uh, was the radios, right? I talked about the Garmin GPS, Vista, uh, but they- You guys they, just got embitters or something? Yeah, we all got embitters. Like right which, before you're leaving? Like, how do you work this type right of- Because it came out leaving, right about that. Yeah. Yeah. But nice. uh, um, what else was new then? Javelins. Javelin nice. rockets were uh, missiles, uh, rather, were newly fielded. And some of our, our weapons guys had just gone through a fielding course mm. with this group there at Fort Campbell um, on the javelins. And the of course, beginnings of war. Carl Gustav, Seriously, you know, so yeah. like, what do you choose from, you know? Right. Uh, it's like a Matrix game, right? Where you, you, you're in the arms room and you're just saying, okay, right. You know, what am I going to dress up as today? And you start putting <laughs> things out yeah. and uh, just going with it. So we were, we were heavy. We were too heavy. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, had hundred pound rocks, you know, and, and, uh, the one sixtieth uh, flight lead guys in that planning port before insertion, they're like, you guys are overweight. You got to cut weight. You're so, like, we're not coming back. No, we're not going to see anybody till spring. <laughs> you know? what do you take out of here? You yeah. So we, we, uh, we dropped body armor and helmets. So we, we went in just, you know, desert camouflage uniforms yeah. and, uh, you know, mountain boots. We didn't, we didn't take in, uh, body armor or yeah. helmets at that point later after we got out of the kind of rural unconventional warfare mountain yeah. phase and got into the city, uh, and got established in a team house there, you know, everything changed the, the transportation changed from mm-hmm. horses, you know, and having 3000 militia fighters on horseback, wow. which was something out of like Lawrence of Arabia or the yeah. wild west it was just incredible. Uh, to now you have ATVs and pickup trucks and now I've got captured, you know, T-55, uh, tanks and, uh, uh, Soviet armored personnel carriers and towed artillery and, and all this aspect. So we obviously, we have, now it's an urban environment, right? So you're going to dress for the dance. So they brought, you know, we got our body armor, uh, sent in, even our chemical suits oh, <laughs> were to us, uh, wow. It, what did but, you think uh, when you saw that first cavalry charge? Were you like, I cannot believe that I'm seeing this? Yes, uh, yeah. that's an understatement. It's just, you know, to, to recognize uh, the lethality of the weapon systems that we're going up against and the capabilities. You know, our militia force has AK 47s and PK, you know, the Soviet machine guns, that PK machine gun, uh, a few handful of Dragunov sniper rifles. But their heaviest weapon is basically an RPG mm-hmm. set that they're carrying on their back, right? right? On horse, and uh, you know, as they're moving along. But uh, they, they, we were able to witness their tactics, their fire and maneuver. Uh-huh. You know, maneuver force and a base of fire element. So they had tactics, right? It's just they're using the horses as as the mobility in there, and they lay down a base of fire and another group would mount horses and try to use the terrain and the cover and concealment and move to the next ridgeline closer. And then they'd become the base of fire and, and, you know, bounding overwatch to close that gap uh, with the enemy. And then finally, then there's that, that last deadly quarter mile that is just 
you know, they're, they're mounting up and, and getting after it. And so our job, we were on a plank you know, in overwatch of that was to bring in the close air support and time it, you know, and take out the priority targets of tanks and, and uh, uh, armor personnel carriers and the heavy weapons. So, wow. and your, your, uh, your viewers here are happy to read about this in uh, Swords of Lightning. Yeah. Oh yeah. They get a book. I'm going to get it. I'm going to hold it up. I'm going to post about it. So I can't wait to, to get my hands on that and check it all out. How about Malakas? Uh, yeah. So a couple of reasons why we titled our book, uh, Swords of Lightning. Uh, you know, there's been some other works done about us uh, as well. Um, but uh, one of those, besides what you showed up earlier, uh, Doug Stanton's Horse Soldiers, there's Brian Williams' Last Warlord. Mm. Brian had gone back on the ground a number of times and got the account of this experience right after 9-11, the, the Afghan version of what happened. And it came out about this legend in Uzbek lore back in like the 1300s of 12 foreigners that showed up to fight to help some local tribal group that was outnumbered by another rival tribal group and and uh, valiantly fought in battle, right? This is a timeless story through different cultures, right? Uh, but these 12 avenging angels you know, were believed in their lore to have swords of lightning uh, that they wielded in battle. And so that connotation to our mission after 9-11, you know, General Dostum and these other commanders are like, you guys have this death ray. Well, they're talking about the special operations laser target designator. Oh, my goodness. Right, that thing, that thing was serious. Yeah, yeah, but you're you're lazing a target that they can't, you know, right? You know, you can't really see it with uh, the naked eye. Uh, and then they're just the making a target. Hit. And then boom, it. yeah. Explode. So as you're verifying that target, part of the process was to have the counterpart commander look through the viewfinder. Is that the enemy position? You see him over there. We're going to strike it. And it was, that's where this kind of blend of their legendary lore in Uzbek history wow. uh, of these 12 foreigners helping this group fight another uh, superior force that wielded these uh, mythical swords of light. So, and, and not to mention Legends. that, the, right. you know, that special forces patch, right? That oh. arrowhead with the uh, 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 sword and the three lightning bolts, Amazing. right? That's Air landing. Cool. Wow. So, and did you guys all at least have, do you have, everybody have nods? Yes. So everybody's got nods. PBS 15s uh, or what do you have? Right. I know some people are going to be blown away by this. Remember the 14? Oh yeah. You guys have it's, it's a monocle, single tube, oh, right? Man. So you either wore it on, on your head, oh. uh, head mounted thing, which I hated those things. They yeah. wear a hole in the skull, right? Yeah. The, what, what, uh, the skull crushers. Or, yeah. The skull crushers with man. the single uh, M14. That's what I preferred. Uh, uh, but some of the guys mounted them onto their weapons. Yeah. Oh, or then you could also, we had the PVS seven. So you oh got my the, goodness. Uh, again, the, yeah. the dual eyes, but one single tube again, yeah. right? People got spoiled later on. You know what I mean? You yeah, guys are going in there cool. with the, you know, 19, the top of the line, 1990s stuff. Uh, yeah. and you're getting it done. I mean, you're getting it done. Gosh. It's a map it's old school. It's map and compass, uh, your wits dial, just gotten it out every day. Uh, we lost, uh, 20, 25 pounds of body weight. Uh, you're eating only one MRE a day. Uh, you're living outdoors exposed to the elements. We got snowed on, you know, you're breaking ice on the stream in the morning to water the horses, yeah. you know, um, just <laughs> Amazing. Every, tested you in every way, mentally, physically, uh, uh, through that it tested my leadership, yeah. uh, with, with trusting my guys. Again, if you know about our mission, one of the, the key points we point out is, you know, we split our 12 man team up into six man sections. Mine went forward and started doing the, the close air support uh, and the fire maneuver and, uh, and assessing these guys in battle, what their capabilities are. Chief Pennington's uh, portion of the team, they stayed near where uh, we had inserted, but then they started doing the assessment in that area of uh, working with the locals in that area, you know, uh, gathering intelligence and building up our logistical footprint. So every night we had MC-130 
special operations aircraft coming overhead and dropping. We're running multiple drop zones every night uh, to bring in lethal aid, non-lethal humanitarian aid or team gear. Right. Yeah. So now you're having, you know, bought, that was just as dangerous. You're having rival factions are competing for supplies yeah. on these drop zones and, and local civilians show up. They're just hungry and, and need food or shelter. And, and uh, so you're trying to support all of that yeah. uh, as well to maintain the local populace support and everything. But the, uh, and then we're using donkeys to bring the supplies from the drop zones up to the forward yeah. uh, positions. But we went even riskier where we recognized we had a split again with that fire maneuver element. We got to split our team into three man cells. And so we'd match a three man cell of Green Berets with an Afghan commander that would have between 300 to 750 fighters. Wow. And we basically dispersed uh, four, uh, four of these three man cells in different counties. Yeah. And the unit measure is a seven to 24 hour horse ride. Seven to 24 hour horse ride yeah. between them. I know because Will and Vince, my communication started, they took turns yeah. riding with me every day with the militia leadership back and forth between uh, the units uh, to visit uh, these sergeants. So our, our Green Bray sergeants became the, the advisors, the de facto commander of that unit. Yeah. They're the intelligence, they're gathering information in there. They're coordinating their own airstrikes, their own resupply. Jeez. And that's how we built up this militia army from 300 to 3,000 on horseback to then bringing these other leaders in and then having 5,000 militia fighters. And we had to get in two more special forces teams to help us advise these other factions. So how many we, days all together? We, 20, yeah, 24 days on horseback. 24 days on horseback. 24 yeah. days on horseback. We... It culminated in a, a battle at a pass uh, just south of Mazari Sharif. And then on November 10th, uh, you know, Mazari Sharif was liberated. We, you know, entered into the city with uh, the militia factions Jeez, and the Taliban geez. had fled. We, over that 24 days, we employed over 300 airstrikes nice. uh, from every manner of aircraft. That's still probably a record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's single team. <laughs> A single team doing that. That's awesome. And we had, uh, uh, as we split out, we brought two of the Air Force JTACs in. Yeah. So that five satellite capable radios, you know, to yeah. split out, see what we did. So there's there's a whole lot of lessons people can learn about in our book, Swords of Lightning. Yeah. Uh, available at swordsoflightning.com. Nice. It pairs well with horse soldier bird. I heard it does. I heard, I heard that's true. Were, were a lot of those engagements, were a lot of those engagements during the day because those you know, the people you're working with don't have nods and yeah you know oh wow Most, mostly at day and then at night uh you're still moving uh but we're you you're doing more uh reconnaissance yeah get close you know or you know get some eyes on them yeah uh, but the horses gave us the mobility in that terrain you could yeah. get in around behind them amongst them okay you know in that rough terrain they got vehicles you know tanks and apcs they're tied to their fuel depots so man Gosh, that's, I believe it was over 20 years ago. I mean, my yeah, God. I can't believe that. It's but, uh, no UAVs, no UAVs yet. Yeah, no UAVs, no tactical UAVs. We did, uh, uh one of the guys were surprised when we had our first airstrike when they're they're dueling a tank basically in a village and trying to get precision strike on the tank. And uh, at the time, they did not have a soft lamp. And again, so they're using a map and a compass and flash bang range estimation and all these other things. And they had a, a platform come overhead and they started to talk them on, you know, look out your, your right wing. You're going to see this bringing them down. And the, the, the voice on the radio, as it was explained to me, they started laughing, going, hey, we're, we're a predator. We're an MQ-1, uh, you know, a UAV. But, uh, and they were unarmed at yeah. that time. The UAV got eyes on the tank and got the right coordinates and passed it through the whole chain. And then they, they, you know, that other asset came in and struck the tank. I mean, it's amazing. You guys are, you know, figuring this out as you go back then, you yeah. know, and you're adapting and yeah, doing what, what special operations does adapt. And yeah. I've, I've had a number of pilots from both the air force and the Navy 
tell me that uh, the, all those lessons that were gathered out of those early mm-hmm. phases with all the airstrikes that we were involved in uh, has helped to, uh, they're incorporated, you know, into the JTAC courses. They're incorporated into your training up at uh, Fallon, Fallon yeah. uh, you know, and so I, I've had a number of Naval and Air Force pilots come and tell me about there's a little block yeah. instruction that, that's throughout that course. So, and touches on those things. And when so. you're out there, are you thinking, I mean, you're just in it. So are you thinking just tactically or do you ever take a moment to pause and reflect and think strategically and think, uh, hey, this is going to be done. We're going to be done in six months. We're going to be done in a year or, hey, this thing, we're never going to be done uh, in this place. Some of both. Yeah. Some of both. There, there was a whole strategic aspect too of I'm sitting with General Dostum and he's on a mountain and he's getting called, you know, by congressmen. Huh. you know, and rumors in the media and was called by other uh, national leaders that were wanting him sort of to like what's going on in Uzbekistan um, in Ukraine. Ukraine. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yeah. He became that kind of point of contact where world leaders mm. yeah. wanted to show their support and understand what's going on. So I'm sitting next to him on literally by satellite phone and we're talking through translators to I'm hearing this conversation firsthand, you know, or involved in it at yeah. different points. But uh, uh, strategically, we were helping to arm and equip his other commanders that were in other provinces to orchestrate an uprising on a certain day where these other units, we wanted to isolate the city of Mazari Sharif. So out West in Maimonon, Faryab and in Samangan and, and Balk and, and different areas, the militia resistance force was all directed to rise up and fight and pin the Taliban and Al Qaeda down in these different areas. Mm. So we move on the main effort. So yes, there was a, a, a strategic aspect to this. But are, but are, but are you thinking like, hey, we're going to be here for 20 years? Are you thinking, no, we're going to mop this oh, thing up in a couple of years here, get out? I, I would tell you at that point, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, at that point, none of us expected to be in Afghanistan 20 years later. Mm. You know, it's like, I'm going to fight through this. We are going to win. Here's how we can win. That's being proposed back and reported to commanders and, Jeez. and just, you know, guys using initiative and accepting the risks on the ground. And, and in some of my photos in, cause I stayed all the way till May of 2002. That's the teams that already started training the Afghan national army by then. Yeah. The government was in place. So if you look at the seven phases of unconventional warfare, mm-hmm. the very last phase is demobilization of militia forces and establishment of, uh, you know, nice. civilian led, Security forces. So we had went through we went all, all phases. phases of unconventional warfare to include demobilization and then wow. training the national force. So it was tied up, bows over, you know, let's go home. And then we got what we got after that. But where are you doing all this time, Scotty? Are you, uh, when do you guys land? Did you guys go to K2 also? How do you do, what's your path? So our team, uh, we departed on 30 September. And we went to Masira Island, oh, yeah. which is in the Gulf. Yep. I did about two weeks with the chief of station in Yemen. I think he had a lot of outpouring of countries. And then countries had this Al-Qaeda problem. Uh-huh. And uh, they said, hey, America, if you're ready, you can do whatever you want. So I spent about the first two weeks in Sanaa and had some fun and adventures there. And then... Um, it got time. They formed a new task force called Task Force k And that's the one uh, Howard mm. was in charge of mm-hmm. down south. So you had uh, SEALs, Green Berets, the assault troop, the snipers. You had the Kiwis. Uh, you had the Australians, the British. You mm-hmm. had uh, Canadian. Canadians. We had uh, the Germans. So you had this multinational force. So our mission became recce and direct action. So as the unconventional warfare developed, they were starting to push Al Qaeda leadership were just on the run everywhere. And they were up on comms communicating, saying, shit, how do we hold? How do we, I need some guidance. What are we supposed to do? And so that led us to do some of the first missions. I think my first mission was uh, nine aircraft, 24 Canadian, their unit to us assaulting, hitting five separate compounds and it was basically the waypoint of all foreign fighters coming into Afghanistan, their personnel section. So we had rows of computers on car batteries, on the Rias. I mean, it was just 
you know, you look back, you're like, well, we thought that was every day, though. Uh, we, we pursued Bin Laden's doctor. If you remember, everybody thought mm. he was uh, sick. Mm. And so we were training this doctor. We actually had a sniper team up on a mountain type uh, observing the doctor's compound and it had a freak snowstorm that night. So the first picture they sent back is them with about a foot of snow on them who had no clue it was going to happen. And then the Camo guy, Rocky, got a kidney stone. The medic had to put him in and out, you know, to combat the pain of the wow. kidney stone because he was the only ones that knew the code and really could understand the KYZ, whatever. Oh, yeah. Thing the kick. <laughs> oh. I mean, this is, this was, there was, it was wild, wild right. west and we hit the compound. So we did hit after hit and it was called relentless pursuit. Yeah. But that, that team did like a 10 day reconnaissance mission oh, wow. uncompromised on that mountain. Dang, yeah. that's unusual. 10. Uh, 10 days uncompromised. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we were hit one compound. Yeah. I think we ended up killing 22 guys in two minutes. Wow. I mean, it was, it was pure warfare. So, yeah. you know, we stayed longer. Once again, I think unconventional teams, you know, started transitioning. Uh, they wanted to consolidate power. He had political activities going on. The DA teams were in their final pursuits of senior leadership. Right. And, uh, you know, you had all of that. And then I think I got home by June of 2002. Wow. And that's by November of 2002, we were getting ready to go into Iraq. Dang. And you did that? Did you, yeah. did you do that first push in? Dang. WMD, baby. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. That wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it was, yeah. and back to the quiet professional, nobody knew it. Hell, teams didn't even know what other teams did. Yeah. Mm. You had no clue. You learned about it over a bar at a barbecue yeah. or, a, you know, a bar in Clarksville. Yeah. What horses? Minutes. You're full of shit. Yeah. Liar. Uh, Bullshit. You know? You know. Yeah, no, that's real. But, you know, there's other great teams that did incredible things. Oh, yeah. 585, incredible mission, uh, all ATVs. They're, mm. they're hauling uh, mortars and Mark 19 and 50 cows around on ATVs wow. with their militia force. Uh I could go on, but it's there's there's half a dozen special forces teams that were part of Task yeah. Force Dagger. Yeah. They were all instrumental, including Triple Nickel I talked about. Yeah. Uh, cool. uh, uh, in Kabul and and the teams out west in Herat, and then the teams that that uh, went into Tora Bora Mountains, mm -hmm. you know, in pursuit of Bin Laden. Oh, yeah. As well, but they're doing it with a militia partner force, mm -hmm. right? Um, That's and interesting. Then, then you have all the anaconda phase, yeah. the 101st has showed up, the Marines are there. You know, Wait, turn these, the war back on. Turn the war back on. <laughs> all these things. I mean, we, you know, Kabul had fallen. All the major cities, including Kandahar, had fallen to friendly militia control by December 5th, right? And they're installing Hamid Karzai as the new interim president of Afghanistan. So it's it incredible being on the, in the forefront of that history. Yeah there as it's as it's happening and uh there uh it's just incredible experience uh working with that team and the other thing the other teams from task force dagger the teams from k-bar so then that's where kind of scott and i come together after afghanistan for iraq i got you know another second life as a captain a senior captain to be able, move over to that specialty unit and be a troop commander. Oh, wow. So now I got, you know, three ODAs worth of guys and our mm -hmm. joint partners uh, and all the, the enablers, oh, yes. you know, and now you're your own little pipe pit and special operations. That's, task force. that's when the feast that came so together of our brothers at JSOC that you get, yeah, the bounty yes. of everything <laughs> that accompanies uh, yeah. the royal wedding. <laughs> uh, it it went from nothing, zero. Yeah. I'm unafraid. Nobody's coming to get you. You're on your own. Screw it. Be prepared to walk out if you yes. have to evade. <laughs> to you know, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, Mr. Brown, Mr. Yes. Pink, Mr. Black, yes, sir. And like, yeah. hold on a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, what was your uni plan going in there? Was it just like, hey, we're gonna, uh, you know, walk north, walk, you know, what? have have gun, have cash, maybe I'll find a car and I can get a few more miles. Yeah, you know, but it was go north uh, to get to the border of Uzbekistan. Yeah, 
then now I get, if, and again, so right, I get to the border, right? Yeah. But you got a little <laughs> obstacle that last hundred yard, hundred about last quarter mile called the Amudaria River of how are you going to cross that major river? Yeah. You know, find a boat, find yeah. a skiff, something. We, you know, we're coming home. Yeah. You know, oh man. One way or another. Yeah. I, was th- but, uh, I always thought about Chris Ryan's one that got away first Gulf War running yeah. to Syria. I yeah. read all those. Yeah. Yeah. We all, yeah. Read, yeah. read all those. Yeah. We all read those, uh, those books in the 90s. But, uh, man. And what did you guys think as you're continuing on here and you're watching Afghanistan evolve? You're, you're, you're in Iraq, you're doing that job. Or maybe you're looking back over at Afghanistan. Are you thinking about that at all? Are you thinking about what you did? I, I and what forgot it's, Afghanistan. What's that? Thought it, forgot Afghanistan. Thought it was over. I had no clue that there were still people deployed in Afghanistan. I don't think until 2005-ish, 6-ish. Yeah. Fifth Group was totally committed to Iraq mm. after that. So, I mean, it was off our radar, had no clue. You know, now we have great friends in third group, mm. right? Some of the National Guard guys that went. So for Afghan, from 03 till, because they didn't have suicide bombers. You know what I mean? It turned into where even captains were mayors of Kandahar. Mm. I mean, you still had maybe a few hundred folks there and some conventional forces. So it was really tamped down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I never thought I didn't go back to Afghanistan until 2011 as one of Petraeus' advisors oh, wow. and went, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> what did you guys do? We had this taken care yeah. of. Yeah. Let me go talk to so-and-so. Let me go. What are you doing? What are you doing here? Wow. You know, Mr. Stay too long guy. <laughs> oh, my so, Lord. Oh. And when did you guys both get out and what, uh, what, what, what made you decide to get out? Uh, I got out off active duty in 2005 after five combat deployments, yeah. uh, uh, you know, between Afghanistan a couple times, Iraq, and then our Africa stuff. Uh, um, just kind of, I was a major at that yeah. point and, and uh, didn't quite see eye to eye with our uh, army personnel assignment folks that, you know, Department of Army had not adopted that there's an actual war on mm. you know four years after 9 11 and our units being tapped to send guys to different every country like you guys said every allied partner wants a special forces or a special operations liaison element yeah. you know i can't remember what they called them back then you know so we're being tapped fifth group was being tapped that's where the other groups to send break up teams you know that comes out of hide right you're sending a team or guys to go work in an embassy you know, on a six month rotation, yeah. you know, sitting clothes, working with advising that partner, perhaps, you know, helping gather intelligence on Al Qaeda or whatever that, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and so we, we have all those taskings to fill. And then here, uh, big army wanted me to go, uh, uh, you know, go do recruiting right, or, or go do other things that any major in the army can do. Right don't need a special forces major yeah. with, you know, so anyway, I, I, uh, I end up resigning short story here. Otherwise we're gonna have to have another bourbon and, uh, became a contractor, yeah. you know, and, uh, um, we started a tactical training company out in Phoenix. Okay. And, uh, we touched on some of that earlier and, and we're training, uh, law enforcement, but then training special operations team and our allies to prepare them to go over to Afghanistan or Iraq. So I was doing some of that tactical training bit for a while uh, with some other uh, uh, special forces veterans that I knew. And then that, you know, I didn't understand the business aspects of what was going on around that company. Mm. And uh, it, 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 they didn't fulfill what they told us they were going to do on on the capability and value that we were creating. As, as veterans. And, uh, I did not admittedly did not understand that yeah. well, the financial aspects were going on. Um, but, uh, that ended. And then I ended up, uh, taking a, a contract job, uh, in Iraq mm-hmm. to run a protective security detail, yeah. uh, to hand off from a SEAL team yeah. to then a real gray kind of contracted entity working for the U S government. That was a mixed American SF and Brit. SAS. 
uh, but Garden, the prime minister of uh, Iraq, yeah. Dr. Alawi, for a year. Got it. And I'm very, I'm as proud of that mission as any others I've done. Um, uh, you know, working with the various U.S. units, helping train and advise our Iraqi, Arab, or Kurdish counterparts. Yeah. Uh, we trained our asses off in, in Iraq. Uh, I wore a suit more in Baghdad that year than I've ever worn in my life. <laughs> you know, there's got to be Middle Eastern or Iraqi TV or Kurdish TV that, you know, I'm with, you know, you know the deal. If I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the agent in charge. I'm the head of that protective detail. I am right with my oh, principal yeah. all the time. So you're, you know, uh, you're trying to protect him in, in every way that we can. We just had an incredible team of Brit uh, special operators, uh, Australian and American uh, working in that capacity yeah. and, uh, was all over the middle East. Uh, again, you're a witness to the history yeah. being made, you know, the American ambassador, the Brit, the Australian, the Iraqi president, the Kurdish president, we're having breakfast or we're meeting every day. So I've got, you know, I'm interacting with the security details. You're cooperating with the other details, right? Cause you know, you're hosting large, highly visible, high, you know, high threat, venues that are targets for the the uh insurgents you're sort of the gray Iraq. man in the room right yeah. you're always there you're listening mm -hmm. you talk to him more than anybody else talks yeah. to him in no. between or and after yeah um i i did the same thing you know after mark left the team i think it was Djibouti, right yeah. the last time we were just pursuing foreign fighters in africa it was a fun trip funnest <laughs> almost combatish semi every once in a while a whole nother drinking story, <laughs> Djibouti, Djibouti, the rim of the asshole of the world. But, uh, you know, I did another couple of Iraq tours and I think I was just mentally getting so burned out, yeah. of, you know, just day after day breaching, blowing shit up, you know, killing just everything uh, that I, I saw an opportunity to come to Florida where I grew up and I finally came to the headquarters of special operations. And I learned that there were only five Green Beret NCOs in the entire four-star headquarters. Wow. They didn't know what to do with us, right? And I didn't know what to do. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're with a captain or a major, and you're on the edge of the world, and now you're in the tea and leather-bound you know, boardrooms you know, having big discussions. Yeah. And that's when they started that task force. That's where I met Ed Winters after he would leave the, the Team mm -hmm. Six. He came there. Scotty Miller left Delta. He came there. So I got to meet mm. the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got integrated on the national level. Got it. And I saw the frustrations of just getting ourselves, our interagency partners to work together. Yeah. They had competitiveness. You had the DEA with their own IT system that won't share a room with the agency people and their IT system that won't share a room with the FBI and their IT system, and you're like, I mean, how, decade how, after 9/11, yeah, and like, how are we going to win this? Uh -huh. I mean, now you're having criminal packets. So I saw a different level, and I retired here in Tampa in 2000, uh, into 2010. I get asked by uh, an agency buddy to come on a program, which at the time was advising McChrystal and then Petraeus, and I was taking old operators back. And you're basically walking the battlefield as a Ronin. Any meeting, any helicopter, anything you wanted to do and go see, it's called the directed telescope. You can literally walk in and you had the special pass. Well, that's cool. How long did you do that? You, well, How long did I, did you do that? For, I did it for a year. You know, I was watching kids getting their legs blown off and young medics for their first time trying to administer morphine again. I'm like, this is 10 years. What do you mean? You, you know, so I, I saw the dichotomy of what are young servicemen and women mm -hmm. uh, brand new to the battlefield for the first time. I saw soft teams that had never, ever been in country and had no knowledge that the district they were in, that this is the personality. Mm -hmm. This guy's a criminal. Don't worry. This guy's trying to get him captured. Right. None of that. And uh, I gave a report at the very end, which I thought was... Uh, my swan song because i knew as soon as i turned it in i was out and it just had an american soldier in his gear and a taliban and it said 1.3 million dollars for an 18 year old soldier 
$17,000 for a Taliban soldier and a rusty AK. Next page. U.S. Academy grad, $3.2 million, Ivy League education in charge of 24 people, $20,000 Taliban subcommander, two cell phones and a rusty AK. And I went all the way down to a $3 HME explosive device, killing a million dollar MRAP, a $67,000 JDAM, killing a farmer who's getting $3 to bury it. And I said, economically, we'll never win. Wow. You can't. And that was it. And I left. And that's when I vowed never to do government service again. And I went to work for the Green Beret Foundation because I started to see guys that believed um, in their mission with their heart and what it was doing to themselves and their families. And we needed to, as a warrior class, protect that. Right. The country needed uh, to receive them and understand what was going to happen. So that's why I did the Green Beret journey for a few years. I think we all kind of go through that. It's finding that new mission, purpose, and focus to to use Task Force Dagger Foundation's mantra. But that that's really it to me. Uh, And I I get a number of veterans come up to me, you know, at at these horse soldier bourbon promotions that we do. Uh, You know. And young veterans will come up or guys that are struggling with that transition, you know, from active or guard services. It's it's daunting. But, you know, I I tell them you got to find that new what motivates you. You have skills. You have experience. You have leadership, problem solving, your commitment, your drive, you know, get in the economy, get get learn a new for us. To me, I tell people this this bourbon business is learning a new language. Mm. The business of business, learning, learning about it. We're learning every day. We're still trying adapt and learn and evolve and, and read. Yeah. Uh, uh, you I know. think uh, we all committed ourselves and our families who stuck with this to say that was the past. Yeah. Right? This is the future. If you, the, uh, we all want three great chapters in our lives. We lived in exceptional first chapter of service, right? I mean, to hear the stories, statues, movies, all this other stuff, but that's the past. What can you do on your second go around? Mm-hmm. Can you, just like World War II, come home and build this economy and re uh, go to parades and enjoy peace and civility, right, and fight for that? And then what could be the third part? And for me, it was I got tired of talking to rich people about how rich they were so I could get a few dollars for them for my brothers behind me. And I said, I want to be on the other side of the table. I want to make wealth because once I have it, guess what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to influence right? I'm going to inform and I'm going to give back. So uh, for us, our pursuit now, we're going to build a great business. Uh, We can stand our weight against any bourbon or liquor brand you see on the market today, just on the business acumen. Mm. And we have a real backstory. Yeah. Pretty soon this business will give us all. You know, you have to have that at the base, you know. It does. And that's people are like, they're surprised. They want to pat a veteran on the head going, oh, you were such a good commando, you know, uh, show me how to shoot. Keep underestimating Keep us. Keep underestimating us. I'll blow right past you. And if the more we get our brothers and sisters in arms to get in the economy mm-hmm. and start a business, then start connecting those businesses together. We we go into veterans group and distributor, distribution and the retail. We tell our story. We underground them. We unite them. We unionize the veteran community in our business partners. Yep. And then we just go at it. Yeah. Ah, oh, man, I love it. So guys coming, uh, a buddy of mine's coming here tomorrow. SF guy, I got both legs blown off in Afghanistan, uh, Caleb Brewer. And uh, he started an, an archery shop in Tucson. He's passionate about archery. Uh, just, I mean, such an amazing guy and does his CrossFit workouts every day. You can go to look at his Instagram. He's doing amazing things, but loves archery. We got on the mountain together a few years ago, shooting and, uh, he's bringing me a bow and, uh, and I'm, I'm like, you hundred percent invoice me on this thing. I want to help out as much as I can, but yeah. this is his passion. He's coming up here tomorrow. And so we're going to hang out a little bit and, and, uh, sling some arrows, but, uh, that's his passion. He, you know, he found that and he, you know, and, and, and it's an inspiration along the way because he didn't just get out yeah. to do that. He did it without legs. And, uh, it, it's incredible, incredible guy. So inspiring. I think, you know, part of our messaging and I get frustrated is I listen to everybody else talk about veterans, how helpless and hapless we are sometimes, right? There's a lot of people that's made a lot of money saying, 
veteran over there. Mm. You know, we got to help them. And uh, I've seen some friends fall into the free trap as well. And, you know, all we wanted to do is just, you know, let's be friends. Let's start something together. We didn't know what it was. We found a common interest. We pursued it. We built a business. We, we sought knowledge in areas we knew nothing about. And, and we got there, right? And so now I spend a lot of time, and Mark does too, just talking backwards to veterans saying, get up, get out of the mud, you know, attack the, attack the hill, be a great, passionate patriot, and live the American dream you've been defending. There you go. Good. Yeah. No, I love it. Uh, I love it. That's it. It sounds like very similar what you guys did when you guys looked at the space, you went to Scotland, you did your, your, uh, your road trip from, uh, from Driggs all the way back to, to Tampa and visiting distilleries along the way. And you're looking at it like a battle space. I mean, you're looking at your competitors yeah, yeah. or who may be your future competitors. And, uh, and this similar thing that I did, I, I didn't, I thought writing was I could come up here to the mountains and I could go into a cabin and write and send it to New York and then start my next book. No, you have to build a business just like any other. Uh, and yeah. it's a startup, just like just like you guys. You have to figure out those budgets and marketing and advertising and social media and engagement and all the rest, anything you'd have to do for, for any business to include this one right here. Um, but that's what I did. I, I realized that a couple months before the first book came out and just uh, embraced it and looked at it like I would the battle space and looked at it as, okay, how do I capitalize on momentum? How do I identify gaps? How do I adapt? And uh, what hasn't, what, what are authors not doing in this space that you can do today that you couldn't have done 30 years ago and just look at it like we would look at the battle, battlefield. This, this has challenged us in so many ways. I, again, I said, it's, it's a new language, learning about it, being humble. EBITDA, and, right? Cost yeah. of capital, um, you know, all of, the amount of lawyering that goes on, I've learned new business fundamentals that um, you took for advantage when you were the operator at the very, very pointy end, all of that. Think about all your personnel actions, your pay, your medical, everything yeah. was fed into you. Um, and then you go out and do unconventional warfare and you have nothing. So you survive on just what little wits and mountain man skills you grew up with. And once you get in a business, once you retire out of the military, Remember that movie, uh, Judge Dredd, yeah. <laughs> when the judge had to leave the big gates and he had to walk out into the abyss with nothing? Oh, interesting. That's what it felt like when I left service. Okay. And I had to walk into the woods and find my friends who were walking around aimlessly, too. Mm. And we just came together and said, all right, let's pursue something. And we discovered uh, what we had a passion that others didn't. It's called knowledge dominance. If I know that I just discovered I didn't know something, uh -huh. I'm on it, right? And it became bourbon. It became branding. It became marketing. We would separate. We would do after action reports. We would do human intelligence, yeah. talk to the financiers, publicly traded companies, mergers and acquisitions. It was sales, relentless. Yeah. Sales, marketing, sales, logistics, yeah. supply chain management. It's It goes on and on. And but veterans know this. Yeah. Veterans know this because they've, whether you're at the squad through battalion level, whatever, you know this. You, you don't know you know it. Yeah. yeah. Man, and when and in this in this journey, when does the, the movie come about and how does that all play? Uh, in? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> uh, you know, I had to so ask. The movie, yeah, the movie 12 Strong was uh, based off of a book by Doug Stanton called The Horse Soldiers. Uh, but it was also influenced by a book uh, called The Last Warlord, uh, authored by Brian Williams. And, and those were the, the two prominent ones that were out there. There were other people that had written about us. Some of them we didn't even know. They just write about you. Huh. Uh, and then uh, 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 some of them got it very wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, Horse Soldiers had been, you know, uh, the movie rights were sold. And eventually passed through several organizations, and finally, uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer and and uh, Black Label Media had the rights to produce uh, the film that they thought they were going to call Horse Soldiers, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that they started filming that in like 2016, I think, if I remember right. In 2017. To, yeah, 2017 yeah. to come out in 2018. Anyway, uh, the movie, you know, we're. All along, we're being told by Special Operations Command, uh, hey, will you guys be the advisors for this? Well, yes, we are. There's other examples of movies that are out there of 
that, you know, with special operations missions with, with, uh, <clears throat> Navy SEAL movies, <laughs> one uh, or two, one or two, you know, but that was the model. And, and, uh, I enjoy those as much as the next guy. And, but what I was excited about is they use the real guys to be advisors in that film to, to some level. And the expectation was we would be advisors in this movie about our incredible mission. And then it just didn't, mm. it didn't happen. Uh, it, it finally came about because once they announced, uh, you know, Chris Hemsworth portraying me in the movie, uh, there's definitely a likeness. Um, <laughs> I was going to say. And then, uh, um, Michael Shannon portraying Chief Pennington and you know, they're, they're, they're portraying every guy on the team. You know, Kenny Shiard, uh, I probably butchered his last name, but he's a SEAL. Yeah, Kenny Sheard. But he portrays uh, our teammate, Bill Bennett, in true name uh, in that film. Bill's the only, you know, because of the book, we were, when it was the book was written, we were still in active service. So they used pseudonyms for all of us, except for Bill Bennett, who later was killed in Iraq, uh, still on the same Special Forces team. Uh, he was killed in Ramadi uh, doing a raid. Uh, with the 585 team. And uh, uh, so, pseudonyms. We're, we're, yeah, pseudonyms. We're honored they're making a movie about it. The special forces community is excited about it because they really don't, they don't make movies about Green Berets too often, right? Uh, uh, particularly a historical mission. And uh, so we thought we'd be advisors. And when they announced that Naveed Naban uh, incredible actor was going to portray General Dostum, uh, Brian Williams, who wrote his book, The Last Warlord, that's really heavily about the Afghans and General Dostum. Uh, he reached out to Naveed and uh, they start talking. And like the very same day, you know, Brian's asking Naveed, do you want to talk to Mark about, you know, that? And so I'm having a phone call with Naveed. And 15 minutes into it, he's like, why aren't you on set as an advisor? And I'm like, well, I'm not for sure. Uh, well, I want to go to the producers and invite them. And so uh, have at it, Naveed, because uh, they, they, we knew they were about to start filming the movie. Yeah. Uh, and we had not been involved in any of that process. Wow. Uh, and so uh, within days, the phone started ringing. They started asking us questions and then, and then invited us to set. Uh, so chief and I went out for an initial, uh, a three day visit. They filmed it in Albuquerque and, and it was exciting. We we're all excited to be a part of that and, and some little role and meet them and meet the, the, the producers and the staff and the director and the actors. And we, we were holding court the three nights that we were there with the actors, you know, in the hotel bar, they didn't get off work until 10 o'clock at night. Mm. So we're, we're sitting down with everybody from the director, the producer, and just talking about the real mission yeah. and, and the, you know, the scene that they're going to film tomorrow or scenes that they're going to film in a few weeks. And what do you think about this and that? And we're like, uh, you know, you know, this is the real story of what happened. And they're already into the production schedule. We were there the first week of a 10 week film schedule. Uh, we were there the first three days. And it was exciting, and we all thought we were going to be involved. And there was there was ahead, four or John. five of us, uh, along with some of the CIA guys that had now retired, that we thought we would be the consultants, right? You know, in the film. And uh, by the time we showed up, the actors had already gone through some uh, tactical training uh, by some of the SEALs that work in Hollywood. And uh, um, you know, this is an unconventional warfare mission, and there was not a Green Beret involved in the entire production so how long were you on set for uh, we're on set for about three days Jeez. and we were excited about it like i said it's 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 uh it was exciting it was terrifying it was like you wanted to be involved uh but then we weren't so I went through a little angry ranger phase <laughs> you know and, and again trying to step back from mm -hmm. that and and uh they asked us to be involved in it uh with the promotion because it would give us a platform mm. Uh, to talk about and shed light on the real men, the real mission. Okay. And so I'm, I'm glad that we did that. Uh, you know, Chris Hemsworth, uh, you're in my respect. Uh, Cause I saw him in interviews go, wait a minute, let me tell you about the real guy. Oh, wow. Cool. You know, 
and and uh so the, the actors you know they they everybody always asks me well how accurate is the story well it's an incredible story it portrays the you know 9 11 in the first 24 days wow. um the real story is after you know we had a battle that where the movie ends you could make a sequel got it yeah because we had a battle that day as we entered into the city wow. and we had our first urban airstrikes and Jeez. And just on and on. We went on, then no longer needed horses. Now we're on ATVs. And now I have those Soviet vehicles that I got to keep them running with supplies and parts and diesel fuel and, and the right ammunition for that system. We went on for another 45 days of combat operations wow. where my special forces team is Mad advising. Max. Yeah, we call it the Mad Max phase because it was just pure pandemonium of, uh, if you ever seen the Afghan convoy? uh how yeah. messed up that is with just people hanging off of vehicles yeah. and riding on tanks and and going into other combat operations wow. but we went 45 more days in in the the mad max phase mm. before our team was finally extracted so you, in our opinion you could make another sequel about that incredible phase but um the the uh it gave us a platform and an opportunity to share kind of the real story and shed light on it. They do a great job of showing how our team split up, you know, when we're on horseback and we split into three man mm -hmm. teams and, and, uh, uh, they, they give, uh, the viewer a good kind of feeling or feel of what special forces does working with militia partners in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are some Hollywood scenes that are plausible. They happen to other teams, but they didn't necessarily happen to ours. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there are some scenes that we change that are are very accurately kind of portray the spirit and mm -hmm. feel of. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the biggest thing was you know trying to explain to a director and producer that suicide bombers were not in vogue in Afghanistan in November December two thousand one. Right. right? Yeah. That, that didn't. That's not mentioned. That didn't come till after Iraq and those foreign fighters started to migrate back from Iraq to Afghanistan and and uh, but you're that's what Hollywood knows is right. IED suicide bombers, right? Right. The real funny aspect was Michael Shannon only had like six weeks of availability in a ten week film schedule, and then he was leaving to go film uh, another movie. I think it was called The Shape of Water. He told oh. us. But he and Bob were, you know, uh, arm in arm the three days we were on set. Mike was just tell me more, tell me more. What was this like? What was that feeling? Wow. What were you thinking? You know, but Mike started to ask questions about, you know, Bob having surgeries. Yes, Bob's had some surgeries. You know, well, how long did it take you to recover? You know, so he's asking these questions that are kind of personal. And it wasn't until like the third or fourth question that, Mike finally asked, like, Bob, what were you thinking when you approached the suicide bomber? And, and Bob and I look <laughs> at each other and we're like, what are you talking about? The suicide bomber. And they're like, well, in, in the, the script. script yeah. Like, so they had writ, they had to write Mike out of the production to go film the next film. Right. Or there's a penalty. Right. You probably learned this Jeez. from working with Chris maybe, uh, and, and, and the production there. But. So uh, plausible scenes mm. didn't all happen to us. Got it. Uh, happened to other special yeah. forces teams later. Uh, but then some of them we were able to change and add in some humor and some of the absurdity. You know, like they they airdropped our chemical suits into us <laughs> in the middle of that. You know what? Did, I think the best yeah. thing is now we'll do an event. Little old yeah. ladies that come up and hug Bob. Yeah. And ask him how he's doing, you know, where are his scars from the suicide oh, bomber, wow. right? They don't have a reference. They'll read about right. it. Yeah. Watch the movie. We had a great documentary we did. Yeah. And that was just us talking about the reality of conflict. Yeah. But it's it's so but Hollywood has its impression. Right. And I think you mentioned it once on one of your podcasts. When you shoot your first tire, it doesn't blow up and go, <laughs> you know. When, when you blow your first door, when you do all these things for the first time and you're ready for it, even as an operator for your first time, you're ready for what Hollywood has shown you as you grew up as a kid. And then you see it for real. Yeah. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. 
You know, I, yeah. you know, even say it's shooting people sometimes is, is a little different. Mm. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it is the effect of Hollywood, but, you know, for green berets, you know, I think we've been quiet. We were the seals of the sixties. Yeah. We had movies and bubble gum cards and Kung Fu GI Joe grip. And, yeah. Um, so that's all right. It's, uh, it'll come in cycles. Yeah, five I years to maybe. freedom, you know, we have Nick, uh, Nick Rowe. Yeah, yeah. So it, it'll, it'll all come, but there's so many stories. I, what I don't want to happen is to miss the collection of stories, yeah. right? And they're going to evaporate pretty soon. Guys are getting older. You don't remember as much. Um, and we're, we're focused on the end of the phase and we forgot that there's a beginning and we saw it in Ukraine. What do we see? We saw a heavily motorized mechanized units up against handful of resistance enabled and we'll soon to find out as special operators, special forces, right? And that works. It worked then, it works now. And then we're gonna see a transaction where everybody goes, ah, big army, mm. I got this. Big Navy is gonna come floating into the fort one day and it's gonna disassemble the organicness of this resistance and the dynamics are gonna change. Yeah, I, I see it, I know it, I hear it, you know. Here we go again. Yeah, man. Well, speaking of here we go again, what, um, what did you guys think? We're about a one year out from uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. When you guys watch that, now you're on the outside looking in, but you were first in, and now you're seeing people leave. What was it like to, to watch that? A bit about the experiences. Uh, like I said, we, I, I, had, I had stepped away from yeah. this. You know, uh, I left active duty. I did that contract phase, I did some nonprofit phase, helping different nonprofits, uh, you know, Green Bray Foundation and others. And, and uh, then I, I was working uh, down here in SOCOM as an advisor, trainer, you know, training assessments. So I got to see how, you know, our diff, you know, the SEALs and the Mar MARSOC and Special Forces does our training. You know, so, but my point to this is I was kind of done. I had stepped away from that. We like to talk about, we burned the boats like Vikings and we went all in on horse soldier bourbon, mm -hmm. right? So that became my full-time thing. And I was doing corporate speaking and talking to different groups, but then it gave us a platform to help promote the bourbon and share the story and just remind people about 9-11 and September 12th, how united our country was. But I, I, kind of stepped away from, we'll talk about, from that, we'll talk but about the week. I got, uh, I got a little angry a year ago, mm -hmm. you know, when, uh, my phone started blowing up again, you know, Afghans that I had met on my many trips back had, were their emailing or calling or Mark, can I talk to you? And this is happening. It's, it's, we're worried the Taliban is going to come back. So there were some warning signals and things like that, that they were trying to convey. But then, you know, when it all come apart there late, late July through June, July, got, my phone is blown up from other special forces or special operations veterans, people, uh, some I knew, some I served with, some I didn't even know, but they want to call and talk and intelligence officers, CIA officers that are now retired or aid workers that I had met. And uh, I got a little angry at, honestly, at how things were going and and realized I had to get involved. I couldn't stand on the sidelines. So I started working with some other veterans and uh, organizing, you know, uh, ourselves ad hoc to help mm. these allies, you know, that that felt like they were going to be abandoned. And I had I had old militia commanders from 20 years ago are calling me from the battlefield, going, "Mark, we need your help. Will you come here?" And I'm like, "Dude, I'm not even in service anymore," you know. And they're but they're wanting want help. And so it was, it was horrible personally mm. to watch this from the sidelines, as you saw the surge of the Taliban and some of the, the militia groups that I had worked with that fought alongside us years ago are valiantly trying to defend their communities, communities against these Islamic extremists that are rising back uh, and sweeping across their country. I think what you saw, even in Tampa, I call this where old elephants go to die. You can't swing a dead cat with an old general, sort of major, somebody. And I, I think the story will come out about whatever fruit task force and whatever other ad hoc things is 
the valiantry of veterans self-organizing over yeah. phones at midnight. Yeah. And in the alliances we had, not only with the Afghans, but political leadership and Department of State, we actually had presidential staffs calling veterans. Yeah. Because the informal network was firing on all cylinders instantly yeah. and we're arranging things. We had a, you know, an ID section, a verification section. You had all of these task force. Now, remember, we were the experts of task force. And then one day we retired. Yeah. Your skills are no longer required. All of a sudden you have this national crisis. And guess who was the first only and endearing response? Right, was these passionate veterans who served life and death with you know these people still on the battlefield, so honoring that commitment, and uh, it was amazing, and yeah. it brought PTSD back to a lot of friends. Yeah, yeah it, like I said, it, it got I got very angry at, at probably openly uh, the angriest point I've ever been. Yeah, you know, after twenty years to see this falling apart. And people I worked with are now in the upper echelons of their government trying to solve and be a part of the solution to these very complex problems. Yeah. General Dostum was the, had been the vice president of the country. You know, um, others had been governors and some are commanders. And, and some, of, some of these guys had gone through our special forces course at Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. And now they're the senior leaders within their military trying to overcome all these challenges. Uh, to stop the Taliban and uh, incredible effort uh, helping, you know, there's so many groups I'm, I'm reluctant to even name, you know, there's Task Force Pineapple and, and just all these others, you know, guys I knew from here in Tampa. And, and next thing I know, there's a small cell that I'm a part of. Some guys I know, some I don't. And, nicknames like Reservoir Dogs. And, and everybody's a code name, alias of whatever, and where you got secure communications going, and we're setting up these Intel you have operators that and, are handling and, organizations and connected case it's officers and just fascinating, an incredible effort. And I've met so many countless groups, veterans, Marines in Texas, I've met. Uh, uh, guys in Colorado, young captains, active duty guys, yeah. not just veterans, because they were some of the last special operators to be in Afghanistan and their phones are blowing yeah. up because their counterparts are calling them going, you know, please send air support. I'm being overrun, yeah. you know, so it's, it's incredible, strenuous, stressful time for me personally. And, and, uh, I will candidly tell you, you know, uh, it scared the hell out of my family. Yeah. They, they, they think you were uh, get, my co Because they never witnessed that that fever of being like in a joint operations command center, yeah. watching the UAVs, yeah. watching the strikes, watching this. But now it is local, just on your phone, text messages, photos. 24-7, video. Yeah. I have an op center, and I'm throwing maps of Kabul up in my Amazing. living room. Incredible. And I'm running 24-hour ops out of my own home wow. with other, other veterans. But and, you know, you back to, it's been a year, right? Yeah. So healing happens, life happens, right? Yeah. Um, you have to reflect inward. Uh, Mark was very successful in getting out those he cared about. Um, we've, the good thing about it and the bad thing is now America's forgotten, but now you have a trail of families that yeah. um, are so grateful to be here. Wow. And Afghan will will perk up one day. It's a, it's a it's just their nature, you know. There is a future uh, president of Afghanistan probably living in Virginia right now or in Texas. You know, they will go back and fight yeah. for what's theirs. But I, I was amazed to watch the self organization of Ukraine yeah. happen. But then I started to see in the joy riders of combat you know, try to buy their own ticket to uh, Poland and walk themselves into combat. And, you know, I'm here and I'm going to get all the glory of, of what I saw that I didn't do in Afghanistan at the end. So I'm a little cautious of sometimes the enthusiasm mm. of uh, self-organizing uh, yeah. and just trying to be a, a Ronin. I think it's it's it in some ways it's given you know from a year ago it's it's given veterans that renewed purpose 
uh, and focus again uh, and the moral obligation to help allies, yeah. you know, uh, and things like that. But yeah. It, 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 uh, and, and then there's, there's others, there's a full spectrum of, uh, I, I get called asked to go to Ukraine now. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I did, I'm make bourbon now, you know, yeah. I'm trying to 50 and fat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't need to be running gunning in, in, in the Donbass or, or wherever. I do want a tank. Though. And, and <laughs> you can get some of those. You can, yeah. I know a couple guys. Yeah, five years from now, I'm, I'm going on a battlefield yeah. tour. You know what I mean? I'm going to negotiate one of those yeah. tanks. That's the part I did in Pakistan in the 90s was going into Peshawar to all the gun suits. Oh, wow. So you have hundreds of years of warfare, and that was a weapons manufacturing or collection point or dump point. And you would just go find um, Martini Henry lever actions or Strum de Beers or, um, you know, Colt 1911 13 original. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I love that's pretty cool. Those spaces. Yeah, and I can wait so everything's all secure when I can go find myself a tank. <laughs> I'm gonna get a tank. And yeah, you, you'll do it. You'll, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I have my someday. We have a vision someday there might be a bar in the Ukraine that has horse soldiers. Yeah. Nice. So yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah, there, there may so, be one right now. There may be one right now. Yeah, I have my, my uh, Enfield, 1863 Enfield that I got earlier on, oh, not as early as you guys, obviously, but uh, yeah. before, when you could still tell the difference between the fake ones and the and the real ones. So yeah. I got, uh, I gave the Calvary one away though. I'm so bummed I had a Calvary one and the long one, I gave the Calvary one away to someone who didn't get to go to Afghanistan and now a, a warrant officer. And I was like, oh, no, I'm just bummed that I gave that one away. But, you know, he appreciated it. 41, so those little Tommy gun, Russian Tommy yeah, gun. Yeah, little nine gun. millimeter. Yeah, it was... I mean, the beginning of wars were brand you, new in the cosmos. Yes. That's crazy. You can smell the 1942. That's wild. Yeah. You know, yeah I remember hearing those stories, you know, like, gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. But hey, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to make a plug of I uh, had found a 1942 Harley Davidson WLA motorcycle that we liberated nice. pre 9 11. No way. And brought back, you know. So just, you have it still? You know, there's so. It, it's uh i ended up selling oh. it to another special friend and yeah. it, it was in a big the uh, rolling thunder parade oh, nice. in, in every year wow. every yeah. year we go we go on adventures as friends it's like old guy red bull so this year we dove in saipan on some world war ii wrecks and worked with the um uh defense personnel accountability agency the old pow mia to recover the bone no way before that we learned how to sail and we did a ricotta we jumped into Normandy for the 75th anniversary of D-Day yeah. in original World War II aircraft, original World War II uh, outfits, yeah. and our kids jumped with us. So our next adventure we want to do is a motorcycle ride through that area, oh, right? Way. So, you know, that kind of Mongolian, you know, start in Eastern Europe and just ride bikes. Nice. And cover these old, old towns and old suits. Nice. I love and, it. That's Keep going as these adventures. Oh man, was the Saipan one? Did uh, was Mike Waltz on that one? Was that a different? No, he wanted okay. to go. So he, he asked me to go on, and I was like, "Got too much going on," and I was like, Ugh. "Yeah, we went with uh, some friends with Task Force Dagger. Uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, Mark Stevens, former Delta guy, leads that, and they they train every year, and then you train with the archaeologists. So you cool. get uh, recovery dive certified, and then they've identified." Uh, some of these uh, crash sites for these Hellcats. Wow. And so you have to go through laying out the grids, you vacuum everything, you've got a recovery team, you're looking for bone fragments, life-saving osculus. It's all funded through the university and uh, DPAA. And they love veterans because we're focused, yeah. right? You know, we work 10 hours, you know, sometimes you got 45 was, minutes of workout. water. Yeah, it yeah. was a workout, man. Well, and I suck, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, I'm a whale, I'm a beluga, and it takes about 600 pounds to float me down. But some of the other guys, I mean, they're missing legs. And they, you know, it was so fulfilling to what you hope is recover a person lost at sea, right, 77 years ago now. And to know that their families, you know, will be notified and you could close a chapter. We're the only country. That's that that dedicates resources to find uh, POW MIA uh, throughout the battlefields of, of 
And so I, I encourage all your veterans to learn about any one of these groups. And that's how you satisfy your need. Mm. Yeah. Is you become adventurous, you climb the mountains of um, uh, Croatia, uh, you can go into Vietnam, you can dive on these sites. There's so many groups that are partnered that uh, you can fulfill that need uh, to be mission focused and then know what you're doing is going to result in a family, yeah. even if it is a grand. Your grandson. That's amazing. Yeah. My grandfather, MIA in the Pacific was a Corsair pilot back then, 1945 off Okinawa. But, um, my daughter and I, she's 16. We went to the, um, uh, 80th anniversary commemoration events at Pearl Harbor and we volunteered with the best defense foundation. And we got these guys, you know, in and out of the wheelchairs to the events, uh, to their rooms, to their meals, make sure they're taking their medications. And, and for her 16 year old to have a touch point with that generation, I mean, it was just incredible yeah. to see her connect and listen to these stories and hear about um, this guy uh, who Jack Holder, who was uh, on the airfield uh, in, at Pearl Harbor, sees these planes come over the mountains, drop down, strafe the airfield. He dives into what was then a sewage ditch and he takes us over there and it's now just dry, but that was a sewage ditch back then. And then he says he, he jumped up and he's pointing to the bullet holes that are still there and in the hangar, they left them there. And then he runs to the edge of the water and looks and he watches them bank and drop the first torpedoes on, uh, on Pearl Harbor. And my daughter's hearing that firsthand. And then we go, she wants to continue to do this. She was, it was made such an impression. So we went to Normandy this year, did the same thing. And she's there now with a guy who's first in his stick. Tom Rice lives in Coronado, California. Uh, yep. First in his yep. stick out, out at 101st Airborne, jumping into Normandy. Uh, another guy in a glider that uh, you know landed in Normandy. And I asked him, I'm like, hey, did, what, did it feel like crash? And he said, son, it was a crash. You know, they were, and then another guy first, got, one of the first guys in landing craft to storm the beach. And she's there on the beach talking to these guys and yep. then hearing about how they all went through battle of the bulge and all the way to Berlin and the whole thing. And it was amazing. It was life-changing for her. You know, but well, we're going to do it again for the 80th. You know what I mean? We're going to jump again. Our kids, you know, got airborne training. Wow. There's a little place here in Palaka, Florida, around canopy parachute team that'll train your no kids kid. to jump around canopy. We got the original World War II aircrafts. We want to Jeez. jump again. Our wives were sitting on the drop zone with French baguettes yeah, and wine. We're right there this year. That's like I want to climb Point de Hoc. Yep. Um, wow. You know what I mean? So 80th anniversary would probably be the closeout. But just to see the French and their reverence for that America. That was what stood out. Um, I saw so many more American flags in Normandy than I've ever seen yeah. in this country, even on the 4th of July. Celebrating America. Celebrating America. Yeah. They treated these guys like rock stars. We're pushing them in parades in their wheelchairs down the streets. People are coming out dressed in World War II era clothing, uh, getting pictures, autographs. They have these cards, baseball card type things they're, that they're handing out. Everybody wants one. Military Jeeps from that era, motorcycles from that yeah. era. It was absolutely astounding. And it, it, it restored hope in America, even though it wasn't. America. It was yeah. incredible. It was. And we forged longtime friends. So, you know, I encourage anybody, you know, for us, the 80th again, because very rarely do you get to go back and go, okay, mm -hmm. now I know exactly what to do. And I could take more people to enjoy the experience. Because I had, that's the first time I had ever been to Normandy. Oh, wow. I didn't know. No. Nope. Yeah. See, I got, yeah, first time for me, I ever took my family on a vacation outside of the U.S. And we yeah. went to Normandy. It's amazing. I encourage yep. anybody to go do it. Yep. We did three day Willie's Jeep tours with yeah. D Day memory tours. Just amazing yeah. history. Oh. You get away from the touristy part and to see and learn about the real That's veterans, incredible. small unit actions, the incredible challenges they face. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing to meet those World War II veterans. I've met some of the, the OSS veterans. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I think for the 80th, we'll do the OSS oh. tour, right? We're, we're going to follow some of the Jedburgh wow. teams and where they did. Yeah. some of their activities and there's still some of the french marquee family members that share their side wow. yeah right? that's cool so we want to kind of divert from yeah. the traditional beach yeah. landing to the oss unconventional side that's amazing but uh i had a call earlier this week with uh there's an event coming up in san diego called force con hmm. force-con.com but it's to honor the World War II airborne veterans again. Tom mm -hmm. Rice is supposed to be oh, yeah. there. Vin Speranza. It's like uh, September 23rd to the 25th. It's in San Diego. It's in uh, Coronado. Um, but I uh, got invited to come out there. Again, the Round Canopy Parachute Team and, and another one of these uh, uh, World War II Parachute Demonstration Teams, I think called the 
the uh, uh, AVG or something, they're going to jump from some some historic C-47s wow. onto the beach in Coronado Hotel. Amazing. They got skydivers jumping. It's just a big multi-service the veteran hoo-ha. convention. Hoo-ha, that's wow. right. I'm going to check into that. I'm going to check into that if we're around. Uh, yeah, 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 we might be in Holland. We might be going to Holland uh, to take that same yeah. group of World War II veterans back to visit the, the battlefields yeah. on which they fought. So, um, yeah. yeah, that'll be amazing. Uh, yeah, but yeah. if not, we're going to head. We'll be there. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Oh, thanks for telling me about that. Man, dude, you guys, thank you so much for doing this. But what's ahead? I mean, you guys, how many bourbon and whiskeys do you have now? Are there a, a so we have three main ones, right? Our straight bourbon, which is kind of our low price point. It's a higher rise, so great for mixing. You can look at the color of the label. So is that small batch or is it? It says uh, straight bourbon straight whiskey right bourbon. here. Yeah, yeah premium it and says. And then we have that one, that one. We have this one, a gold label, which is our weeded 95 proof. Then we have a silver label barrel strength. And then we have an addition called Commander Select. And that's $595 that honors ODA 595. But those bottles, the most we've ever got at auction was at Tunnels to Towers, $75,000 for one bottle. Wow. So we, um, when we appear and give whiskey and war stories and it's tied to a fundraiser, I mean, they literally go 10, 15, 20,000 once the crowd gets excited. Right. So for us, that goes to charity. Yeah. That's, we're really proud to help. We fact we've helped countless charities raise you know half a million plus Amazing. dollars uh, for their charities, whether that's veterans yeah. organizations, first responders, whatever the, it may the be. The business but. is you can't make enough bourbon. America's a bunch of alcoholics. <laughs> um, yeah, we, once once your friends learn you're in the bourbon uh, business, you yeah. know they're always calling. So. Great friend. But for <laughs> us, in order, as you know, to keep your business, you can't take everybody else's money. And we have been patient about how we grow the brand organically. And so we get to own it because I've seen a lot of friends and uh, business mentors who say they'll ride you like a wet mule. And then when it comes for the payday, you'll get an apple. They'll get the cart. Wow. So we, we understood that philosophy on investment and we still own and run this company till the day she dies a hundred years. Wow. That's yeah. been, you know, and and really for me, I, I I never had money. I don't, you know, see it or need it or care. Um, but for my kids, I can't give them a footlocker full of old war medals and dusty boots, right? So we can create a legacy and a family-owned businesses uh, that will last for generations. I love it. I love it. And then your expansion plans, can you talk, are you, is that still top secret or are you uh, talking about that now? Yeah, we're in 17 states now. So your majority, California, Texas, uh, Florida, Nevada, Montana. So, you know, in various places where major population center, we don't have enough aged bourbon to be everywhere across the United States. Right. So the thing about it, imagine making it and putting it to bed for six years. Right. That's it again. Well, guess what? Next year I got to make even more, put it to bed. So it's starting to wake up like a dragon in the Hobbit or whatever on a pile of gold. Once our bourbon starts waking up, uh, stand back. We're the eighth uh, number one bourbon in our category right now, and nobody's kind of heard of it. Yeah. And that's okay because pretty soon we'll surround them all. There you, go. you know, surround it on purpose. There you go. And they'll be like, who are these Jamos? Because <laughs> the rest of them are all publicly traded companies. Mm-hmm. Do you think they care about it? Do you think the Bean family makes bourbon anymore? Do you think the Brown family? No. They get residuals of a billion dollars a quarter. Yeah. I don't know if they hit the stills anymore. Yeah, interesting. And then what, uh, do you have restaurants coming up? Or what do you, what do you, what do you got going on there? Oh, our restaurant here in St. Pete, we, uh, we are going to open the week COVID hit. Hired 70 employees had to shut down that oh. week. Everybody employed and yeah. half the kids would come in. The other half would practice serving them. So the cooks could cook and the kids have something to eat. And we opened in August. We're only open 27 hours a week. And uh, we've seen over a hundred thousand visitors. We're the number one restaurant in Tampa Bay, according to open nice. table. And because it's such a beautiful, beautiful environment, the wife said, you, you clowns, this is the only thing we get is a little, I love me wall in the team there room. The rest is beautiful. So we're going to build uh, five more of those. The kids own them. 
We don't own them. Because we make bourbon, we can't be a retail. Oh, interesting. Oh, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah. So our big project's in Kentucky. We broke ground in October. I mean, 5 million gallon production, hotels, everything. Retired military horses on site. That's our long-term dream was building Kentucky. Man. Three years. I love it. Yeah. I love it. What, uh, are you allowed to talk about the team room? Yeah. So the team room is like anybody's team room, right? It's, uh, I'll move my camera around. We got bears. <laughs> That's a Denali wow. grizzly that ate somebody. We got wolves. What it is, we have friends in the Fish and Wildlife Service. So whenever a incident happens and they have to put something down, you're allowed to bid on it on lottery after the investigation's no done. Kidding. So we've got saddles and wolves and paintings, and that's our private bar. Nice. Right. And then I don't know if you can see out yeah. the window uh-huh. there. That's the rest. No way. Amazing. Two story. So that's just the team wow. room, and we do our meetings up here. And here I'll show you wow. here. That's the mold from World Trade Center wow. Steel. That's the helmet. They honored um, Task Force Dagger at the Army-Navy game. Crap, the Army lost. That was upsetting. <laughs> but these are all reflections yeah. of gifts from other special operations commands. I got stuff from President Bush. Wow. Uh, I mean, it's just our life, wow. right? And we made bottles for the Medal of Honor Society to raise money. So it's just a collection Amazing. of things in our team room. Amazing. And Swords of and Lightning is over there too? Swords, Swords of, uh, of Lightning there is right is. there? Let me see that. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Nice. Oh, awesome. I'm going to go uh, order that as soon as we're off that. And, you, it, and get it at swordsoflightning.com. Is that the place to get it? Amazon. Yeah, every, anywhere books are okay. sold. Yeah. Anywhere books are sold, Amazon. Uh, Got it. Or they can get it at swordsoflightning.com. Website. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to check out the website and get that for sure. But uh, and I can't wait to visit the restaurant and see the team room and uh, say hi to you guys in person yeah, and share a drink uh, in person. Man. Call ahead. We're reservations only. <laughs> Luckily, I have somebody's uh, personal number there. I can, uh, I'll, I'll text away. Yeah, yeah, I think you're good. <laughs> I think you're good. Now, if you're ever in town, please yeah. uh, always be our guest. And, you know, you're always invited to the team room. Nobody else gets to come in here. It's funny watching all of these restaurant people. They can't see in the windows. And they can't, but they know it's here. Yeah. And they all wonder how they can get in the team room. Yeah. But they, you know, you can't. You've got to be with the team guy yeah. uh, to get in here. Uh, I love it. It's, it's fun. I think this weekend I, I owe some uh, drinks to an F-18 pilot that is in town that flew for us. Wow. So, uh, yeah. look, and we've, we've met so many people through here. It's, it's been amazing to learn about different people's uh, role they played, yeah. where they were. Everybody remembers 9-11. You know, for those veterans that were in service to so those intelligence officers, what were they doing? Where were they mm-hmm. at? So this is, this is a rallying point yeah. uh, for, for veterans of, of all generations. We've had so many people coming in here, too, as well as first responders. So. Uh, incredible. Incredible. Well, I love what you guys are doing. Yes. And uh, you're an inspiration, not just to me, but to veterans across the across the country. And uh, but more importantly, uh, for what you did in those uh, days leading up to and uh, in the years leading up to and then after 9-11. So uh, thank you for that. Well, congratulations to all your success, my friend, as well. Appreciate it. To you, Jack. It. Hey, to you guys. To you guys. Horse soldier. Appreciate it. You guys take care. See you soon. All right, my friend. <laughs> Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There's my original card right there. I got that at Damn Neck, Virginia, when I was at Intelligence Specialist A School at the Navy and Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center uh, on Damn Neck, Virginia, right before I went to BUDS. So it was boot camp, ISA school, BUDS, and then off to the races in the SEAL team. But the entire time, to include through today, I have been a member of Navy Federal Credit Union. And now they're sponsoring this podcast, which is amazing. Crazy how things come full circle like that. Becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel. 
which means the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone. And it's so fast, you can get a a decision in seconds. Navy Federal Credit Union has great rates on auto loans. With their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Nice. I like that. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval, message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. That's NavyFederal.org. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one, in the Amazon series adaptation of the terminal list. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. Keep crushing. Thank you so much to Six Hour for jumping right on board out of the gate to make this podcast possible. Obviously, I am a huge SIG fan, having carried the P226 on every deployment downrange in the SEAL teams. Uh, But SIG was a supporter. They were friends well before uh, I was a New York Times bestselling author, uh, well before I even had an Instagram account or any social media presence whatsoever. So thank you guys all so much. Uh, Ron, Tom, Jason, everybody at SIG who gets up every day and continues to crush it and lead the way. SIG is always adapting. They're always at the forefront, whether it is firearms for citizens, whether it's firearms for our military, ammo, suppressors, optics, training, fire control units. They are doing it all and they're always pushing, pushing that envelope and trying to do it better each and every day through innovation and adaptation, they crush. So thank you so much for that friendship and support. Uh, It will never be forgotten. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right. So what do I have here? Look at this. Makeawoodsign.com. Check them out. Uh, Ryan came out uh, to one of my book signings early on this past May for In the Blood and brought this out with him. Says Jack Carr, cross tomahawks connoisseur of sharp objects. So this thing, man, is solid. Um, oh man, very cool. Uh, it says Jack, thank you for your service and thank you for James Reese. Man, too cool. Yeah, their YouTube is uh, Old Dave One Hundred. So check that out. Makeawoodsign.com. I uh, believe that the Instagram is Makeawoodsign, and then Ryan, uh, his is Makeawoodsign underscore the second. So uh, check that out. You can link to YouTube and all that from the Instagram as well. So makeawoodsign.com. Check it out. And Old Dave 100 on the YouTube. So I'm going to find a good spot for this. Um, Ryan, Dave, Eric, thank you guys. Sincerely appreciate it. And I appreciate all the time, energy, and effort that went into this. You can tell. And uh, man, I really uh, really appreciate this. It's going to find a good spot around here. So thank you. All right. What else do we have? Well, little horse soldier bourbon. Look at that right there. Bam. Scotty Neal, man, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, being a guest and bringing Mark with you. Uh, That was awesome talking to you guys. And horsesoldierbourbon.com. Check out what they have going on. Love that these guys are are just crushing it in this next chapter in life. And uh, love this as well. So very cool. Thank you. And all right. Very cool. Marissa Strider, you can follow her, uh, uh, marissa.strider uh, on Instagram 
And look what she sent out. Pretty dang cool. And you can go to Mick Strider Custom Knives and check this out. Boom, you might remember the Strider that James Reese uses in The Terminalist in the book. And it's also in the show, in the series with Chris Pratt. So he had this strapped, uh, clipped to the inside of his pocket. So very cool. So thank you. Thank you for the note. And thank you so much for, uh, yeah, this is cool. Coin comes in here. This thing is just awesome. So thank you. Look at that. Very cool. So uh, Marissa Strider, thank you so much for sending this out. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys in person soon. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about the Horse Soldiers, about Scotty Neal, about Mark Nooch, be sure and go to horsesoldierbourbon.com. Also go to swordsoflightning.com. That's the book that we discussed on the podcast, and you can get that wherever books are sold as well. And what's so cool is uh, that each one of these bottles is formed from molds made out of World Trade Center steel to cool. Hopefully I'll be throwing back some whiskeys with those guys in person one day soon. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. You can go to officialjackcar.com. That is the website. You can sign up for the newsletter there and hit shop for the merch. And if you enjoyed that conversation, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and be sure to leave a five-star rating and review. Until the next time, take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.